All right. Call the uh, Tuesday, December 21st, 2021 meeting of the Weathersfield Planning and Zoning Commission to order. Um, Joe, could you please uh, call the roll? Sure. Rich Roberts. Here. Ryan Allard. Here. Joseph Hammer here. Uh, Jim Hughes. George Oikel. Here. Tom Dean. Tony Homicki. Dave Edwards. Michael Vieira. David Drake. I saw him. Yeah, he's here. Okay, Peter Labruni. Here. So, and Paul Thompson. Here. All right, so what does that get us? Eight? Uh, I thought it was still seven. Huh? <clears throat> yeah, okay. There's a few just logging on right now. Okay. Vieira, so that's eight. Did I come through, yeah, David Drake? I saw my pictures. Am I, am I muted? You were muted, but no, we, can, we, we got you. Okay, yeah, very we can good. See you now. Okay, thank you. All right, Is Mike's it? here, so that's eight. All right, I will um, seat all three alternates for now. Um, let's see. Mr. Chairman, can First I say something? Is... George sure. here. I'd like to welcome Paul Thompson. Since I wasn't around for the last month, I'm glad you're on the commission, Paul. And being hey. a neighbor, we can even talk to each other a little bit about things. So I was going to say, thank you, neighbor. And and <laughs> uh, also your economic development work uh, on the commission is, uh, which I've been uh, going to as a member of this commission. Uh, you've been doing good work on that, too, so I appreciate all, all of it. Glad to have you with us. Thanks, George. I'm just, uh, I'm single hatting now. I, I left the Economic uh, Commission and I'm, um, I'm with this committee, so uh, giving this one my full attention. Thank you, though. All right. Um, first item, the public hearing 3001-21Z Ocean State Job Lot. Um, Denise, can you please confirm they've withdrawn their application? Uh, this afternoon, they did submit uh, an email to me asking to withdraw the application. Okay. Any reason, so I, Denise? I... Denise? Okay. Did they withdraw uh, any reason? Um, they were having a hard time with uh, getting a corporate approval. Oh, hmm. Hmm. thank you. And and just for um, purposes of planning time management, item three point four, that public hearing um, is going to be continued to January. Do you know what date? The fifth. Uh, they're looking to be on the January nineteenth meeting, which is a Wednesday. Okay. All right. Um, so does somebody want to make a motion to continue public hearing 3,521Z to January 19th? So moved. So motion so made. Second. All right. Motion by Ryan, second by George. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Um, next Two items are public hearings. Um, you know, just to kind of go over it quickly, the way we run the public hearing is first, we'll hear from the applicant. Uh, then members of the commission will have opportunities to ask any questions they might have uh, for the applicant following that give and take. Uh, we'll open it up to members of the public who may, may wish to have something to, to say about the application. Um, following hearing from the members of the public will turn it back to the applicant to respond to uh, any relevant public comment depending on uh, whether there's additional information that uh, we're looking for following that we may decide to continue the hearing uh, to our next meeting otherwise um, we would vote to close the hearing and uh, have deliberations and uh, you know, potentially vote on it. But uh, I think the key thing to pay attention to is 
you know, when the public hearing is open is the time that we hear from uh, the applicant and the members of the public and members of the commission and staff have the opportunities to interact and engage with um, the applicant and members of the public. And once the hearing is over, that, that opportunity ceases. So the first item, uh, public hearing 3,321Z, Brian Shanley, Connecticut, Ear, Nose, and Throat, seeking a special permit in accordance with 52C, permitted uses of the Weathersfield zoning regulations for a change of use to medical office space at 249 Main Street. And is there anyone here on behalf of the applicant? Uh, yes, this is Brian Shanley. Okay, thanks. Um, could you just identify yourself by name and address for the record, please? And then you can tell us what it is that you're looking to do. Uh, yeah, so my name is Brian Shanley. I'm the CEO of Connecticut Ear, Nose and Throat. We're at uh, 988 Silestine Highway uh, here in Wethersfield. I do also reside in Wethersfield at 31 Summerfield Drive. Um, we are looking to purchase the the property at 249 Main Street, which is currently uh, listed as a residence. Um, I believe the current owners had asked for the change of use of that not too long ago. Um, and we'd like to purchase it and open up a facial plastic surgery and med spa location for our office. Um, it's a service we currently do, but only out of our Farmington location. And we'd like to expand and have a facility that's dedicated to that service. Okay. And um, you've submitted a piece of correspondence regarding that. Uh, Denise has written a memo to the commission and summarizing what your application um, calls for. It also identifies um, a whole bunch of the history of the application, I think, from the change of use leading up to the to the current uh, ownership of the property. Um, you want to just talk a little bit about the uh, number of employees you're going to have, hours of operation, days of operation, um, sure. what you anticipate in terms of, uh, you know, patient count, employee count, what you're going to do about the parking, you know, that kind of stuff. Yes. So yeah, yeah, we assume that the main concerns to the community would be obviously the hours of operation, that volume of people that we're going to attract, and obviously the parking situation. Um, our, our general hours of operation will be business hours. So we will be typically nine to six um, every day, probably one late day on Thursday till seven, which is just another hour. And then we don't anticipate opening up immediately this way, but Long term, we would be doing like Saturday mornings from nine to twelve. Um, as far as staff, it's a, it's going to be a small facility. Obviously, the building is not that large, so we would be opening up with a staff of four that includes the surgeon. Um, maximum would be five um, long term, and then with five rooms, we're basically looking at physically on site having a max of six or seven patients at a time. Um, with the parking situation, there is a previously approved um, plan for adding eight parking spaces to the location. We will, obviously, if we are uh, approved for the change of use, we will have to go through that approval again, because at this, at this point, that has expired. But the plan that was presented to the town is pretty much perfectly with what we would want to do. Other than I think I probably would want to match, uh, make sure that we match the brick, um, the, the exact parking that is existing there at Heirloom Market. Um, and then as far as the parking, that would add eight spots, which for a total of 10 at the facility. Based on the zoning requirement for medical use, uh, because we're we're asking for medical use and not just general business. There is a little bit more of a parking requirement there based on the zoning. So that would be 13.21. So we're basically missing 3.21 spaces based on zoning. Um, but we are happy to have our staff park down at Keeney. I, I understand the town also has a grant to potentially do more public parking down there. Um, so we would use that overflow if, if allowed. Thank you. 
Denise, did you have any uh, other comments from your memo that you think are ones that we need to be aware of and address right away? Um, other than the parking waivers, they're not uh, looking for any additional waivers. They will need um, historic district approval for any of the exterior site improvements as the applicant had indicated the uh, certificate of appropriateness um, through HDC has expired. Um, otherwise, you know, at this point, the, the history of uh, recent approvals, um, the, the applicants had never gone forward with the approval. So currently, uh, the structure is residential. Uh, so, you know, other than that, you know, being in the village business district, this use is permitted. Um, they, there is a easement over the adjoining property at two, at Comstock uh, for parking and to pass. Um, but other than that, I have no comments. Denise, okay, what's that? Denise, what's the uh, right of way that's down the back of the parking lot? Is the right of way there? Isn't it on the back side of the building? I was wondering what that was. Is it just an old one that been there for? On the uh, Torres engineering plan that they had submitted. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. But not 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 on the Comstock side, but on the back side of the building. Can you can you speak to that, uh, Brian? So there is a right of way that goes. So currently, um, Heirloom Market has that parking and driveway that goes from Main Street through to um, Church Street, and that that roadway there's a right of way to use that because there's no curb cut for this building. The, the, you have to use that existing driveway through Heirloom Market. And I've, I have spoken with the owners of Heirloom Market um, in terms of you know what we want to do and um, they've expressed interest in us proceeding. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about something that seems to go off of the uh, brick paving of Comstock and goes down back to your building. And I, I didn't know what that is. It looks like an old right of way, but uh, you know, it's shown well, on the pages. Yeah, I mean, what that basically is, is it's, it's a little bit more access because Comstock owns the part that goes down to the south there, the one, if you're looking at the one that has the crosshatch area on it. I think so, yeah. Yeah. I just wondering what it was, that's all. Well, that, it has that's no real meaning, a, I'm not concerned. Well, I, I was going to give you the act of the meaning, which is that, that that's property of heirloom market that would be used to be able to get to the parking spaces that would be built behind the blue house, because oh, there isn't enough room on the lot that contains the blue house, put the parking spaces and have them stand alone with access. Oh, okay. So there's you know, eight or 10 feet of heirloom market property that would have to be included within the easement to allow the use of the parking spaces. So if you go to the go to the, the layout plan that has the the shaded and the cross hatched area, you'll see that the parking spots are by and large on the Belden House property, but the driveway that allows people to, to pull into them and to back out of them is located partially on the heirloom market property. Okay, thank you. Yep. Mr. Chairman, just following up on uh, this sheet that you're looking at, C1. Uh, yep. Question to the applicant. Maybe I'm reading this wrong. Is this an old sheet? Because in, in the gray area, I only count seven spaces and you said that you have 10 spaces. Is, is this um, going to be reconfigured? There's existing, there's existing two spots that are back to back um, in the existing layout um, that we would obviously have to have employees park um, because they would be back to each other. 
that would be blocking each other in right next to the, so as you're looking at the building to the right of the building, there is currently two parking spaces. Where the brick pavers are? I'm not sure. Yes. Following. yes. Okay. I think this is George Arkell. I think actually so far this applicant in his presentation on parking is pretty good considering the issues we've had with more recent applicants in, in the old, old Weathersfield area providing parking. Uh, I like to hear that he's gonna encourage his employees to maybe go down to our town parking area. Uh, it is a distance, but uh, you know, if they're willing to do that, that makes sense to me. And also we, we never seem to discuss uh, town parking spaces in front of the building. Now there's, there's some out there and uh, we don't encourage those to be part of your, your spaces uh, required for, your, for your, your building. But I think you're doing more than necessary considering what I've been seeing lately in applications in all weather's field. Um, Rich? Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, one one positive thing I think is, um, you know, the medical office will not really be operating at the same time of the peak demand for all the different food services and restaurants that may be trying to park at Keeney. You know, it's primarily more during the week, during the day, and early Saturday morning. So I think that's a that's a positive that it's sort of you know off the maybe the heaviest demand for, for Keeney. Um, I'm just having a little trouble trying to count the 10 parking spaces that the memo says they'll be because I understand the two on the pavers that exist, but then I'm only seeing seven new ones in the dark area behind the building. So you know, I, I, I'm looking for one more, I guess, just to see where the eighth new space is. Maybe I'm missing it. Oh, unless there's, so I'm looking at it now. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One of them is well, maybe right? I've miscounted. Maybe it is seven because it looks like there's a section there that in between two spots. Looks like, sure maybe it's a, looks like maybe a fire safety access. Yeah, or something I, from, sorry, I missed that on the original plan. So I'm not sure if that's not allowed to be a parking spot or if that's opening for, for something there. I'm not really sure. Okay, I think it but it looks like there's a spot there. I'm not sure why they have not designated that <laughs> spot. And then one other question, looking at your plans, I mean, they're all defined as exam rooms. And I was, I was just curious, do, do these, you know, do these processes involve, you know, like anesthesia and no. operating type procedures or no? Okay. No, no, just general medical. Yeah, well, that, that's the same issue I had with, with counting. And I believe the answer is it, it's handicapped parking. It's a wider space. That's that's what that implies, I think. Well, that's the side a van would open for a handicap. Oh, so, okay, yeah. that would make sense. Yeah. So that's 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 why you only have seven because that would have to be access for the van. Okay. Right. Uh, one one question. I mean, you you state that you're going to uh, suggest to your employees. Uh, to park, you know, at the Keeney. And then I think in your opening remarks to us, you said, is that okay? Well, that's absolutely okay. I mean, we, we want to encourage that. As a matter of fact, I would say uh, maybe you should be stronger and say that my employees will be required to park in the Keeney Center so that, you know, for sure, uh, they don't take space in your back area uh, again, they could they could always park in the front, but uh, if you do require them to go to Keeney, I think it's best. Would would you be amenable to make that a requirement for your employees? Yeah, we wouldn't have a problem with that. I mean, at the end of the day, it, it's more of a concern for us that the patients have access to the you know the back spots because obviously um, we want some privacy. You know, not necessarily everybody wants to walk through you know on the street and everything. So yeah, we would be fine with that. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, I guess I guess the only thing I would add to that or subtract from that is that rather than tying them to the Keeney, I would just say, you know, any publicly available off-street parking so that if we do build a lot 
behind the fire station or if we do enter into an agreement with First Church or something like that, um, you know, that they could park in those places rather than, you know, having to necessarily park at the Keeney, but we can yeah. talk about that later. I agree with Mr. Chairman. Me, me too. And Rich, I just wanted to just, just so we have an accurate parking space count for purposes of the application and the action that we take, you know, in, in looking back to that sheet C1, there's only seven spots that have the, you know, the cement stop bars in the, in the front of the spot with the, you know, with the designation one as handicapped, which probably requires a wider opening, I'm assuming, which is why there isn't the a space next to it. But so, so I guess is the correct count, you know, seven new plus two. two existing, right? We'd be down. So the total would be nine on site. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Anyone else on the commission have questions for the applicant? All right. If not, uh, are there any members of the public who have any comments or questions about this application? <coughs> any members of the public? Going once. All right. Mr. Chairman, I, I don't see any. What? Yeah, sure, Joe. The, um, there was a comment in the town engineer's memo indicated that a portion of the new parking is you know on the other party's property so i just wanted to simply ask does whatever whatever is that within the scope of whatever easement is already in place so that there's no question about the applicant's ability to build all seven of the of the new ones and keep using the the two existing my understanding from the plan that yes that is that is why the easement's there and it's it only extends through that Okay. Okay. All right. Um, while we still have the hearing open, are there any other final questions for the applicant or for um, Denise? If not, someone want to make a motion to close the hearing? I move to close. Second, George. Okay, motion to close the hearing by Joe, second by George. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? All right, thanks. Um, someone want to make a motion on the application itself to start this session? I would move to approve with the condition that the applicant uh, direct its employees to utilize uh, off street parking, not on the, uh, not on the, uh, subject property. Second. I'll second that. Okay. Good. Um, motion by Joe, second by Peter. Are there any other stipulations, Denise, that we need to include from your memo? I guess I guess the one thing I was unclear is are we are are we basically saying that they will build it in accordance with the prior approvals or do they have well, to come back? I, you know, I think that you know he's here because with the option on the property, he wanted to make sure that you know he was able to gain the approval. But I think as a condition of approval, because he has to go through historic district for the exterior site improvements again, I would say, you know, and, and Derek, the town engineer is on the call as well. I would say as a condition to, you know, work with, work to satisfy, work with the staff to, you know, satisfy the, the, the parking, the ultimate parking layout. Uh, on that point, Denise, this plan that's submitted here, is, is this the plan that the town staff expects will go forward? This is the, pre this was a previously approved plan that 
you know, the, the um, current owners just never went forward with. So, I mean, you know, the approval is still, um, I mean, 20, I would 2019, I would it's not expired through the Planning and Zoning Commission, but in terms of, you know, I mean, it would have to, it would have to mirror it exactly. So if there are changes to that, you know, we, we would like to see any, any of that. That's my point. Should should we, uh, Joe? Should we also add a stipulation here that if there's any changes to this plan to the parking to, plan that they yeah. they bring they it back to. to the planning and zoning commission for review? Right, but there's other yeah. things in here as well that the engineer may be interested in. You know, I don't see any drastic changes, but maybe we should just simply say that they should work to this plan, uh, and if there's any major changes. Well, then they have to come back to us. Well, I think I think that makes sense, but I'd like to just kind of back up one step before that, which would be to basically reincorporate into this approval all of the conditions that were imposed on the prior application, um, January 15, 2019, 2019, that are listed yeah. on yeah pages two and three of the memo, just basically that you know the the changes to the to the notes on the plan and the you know be careful about the pavers and that sort of thing that um you know those conditions from our last approval are all carried forward and on top of that if there are any you know further changes from what has been presented this evening or as a result of any <coughs> hcc approval you know, that has to come back to us for, for further review. Yeah, I, I incorporate, I, I, I add both of those uh, conditions to my motion. Okay. Is that all right with you, Peter? Yeah, it's fine. It's great. Okay. <clears throat> all right. Does anyone else have any comment, any further discussion on this? All right. If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Motion carries. Congratulations and good luck. Thank you very much. All right. The next item, 3.3, .3, public hearing 3004-21Z, uh, Phoenix 1210 LLC seeking special permit and site plan and design review in accordance with section 10-1E change of use of the Weathersfield zoning regulations for modification to previously approved site plan to change the phase two building use from medical office to school at 1210 Silestine Highway. And I'm guessing Kevin Johnson is here on behalf of the applicant, but I also want to Introduce for the for the Zoom world, um, Dominic Caruso, the planning consultant, uh, who is here tonight, who has reviewed the plans, and um, Derek Greger, town engineer, has also reviewed the plans. So, you know, I think following uh, Kevin's presentation, uh, I would ask um, Dom and Derek whether they have any further. Uh, comments or thoughts that they want to present to the commission um, before we get into the get into the public portion of the hearing. So with that, I'll turn it over to the applicant. Uh, good evening, commission members. For the record, Kevin Johnson, uh, Close Jensen and Miller. Uh, also with me this evening is uh, Mike Panic, uh, owner of uh, the subject property. Uh, Mr. Charlie Nyberg, uh, project architect, uh, Mr. Chris Sabidio, uh, project engineer, and Mr. Mark Bertucci, uh, our traffic engineer. So just a little bit of housekeeping first. Uh, this is a public hearing. Uh, signs were posted on Mill Street uh, as well as Silas Dean Highway um, in the location by the former Puritan driveway. Uh, legal notices uh, were sent and proof of the mailings were emailed to uh, the planning department. So just a little bit of a uh, quick background uh, on the subject property. Um, 
for anyone who may not be familiar with the site, but I, I think you all are. Um, this is the site of the former Puritan Furniture uh, Warehouse. Um, this project received site plan approval in February of 2020. Um, the previous approval was for two uh, medical office buildings. Uh, the phase one building was a one-story building. Uh, the phase two building was a, a two-story building uh, each containing 40,000 square feet. Uh, the one-story building is the one that's presently constructed. Um, also constructed to date uh, is the utility infrastructure, uh, and that also includes uh, stormwater uh, management system, uh, and this includes uh, the water quality in, in, uh, structures. Uh, these structures were installed to ensure that all uh, storm-related runoff uh, would be treated uh, prior to discharge uh, to Gulf Brook, uh, thus meeting the goals of the MS4. Um, significant portion of the parking has already been constructed, including the main access aisle uh, that goes from Mill Street to uh, the Puritan Drive, uh, site lighting, landscaping, uh, and there was also wetlands mitigation uh, constructed as part of the original uh, permit approvals. Uh, Denise, if I could share my screen. You're all set, Kevin. Thank you. So I'm gonna go through a series of uh, plans here. Uh, this is our existing conditions plan. Uh, just a quick orientation. So Silas Dean Highway uh, would be to the top of the sheet. Uh, Mill Street is over to the right. Uh, that's also direction north. Uh, the railroad uh, tracks are towards the bottom of the sheet. Uh, what you see for building uh, and, and landscaped islands uh, and the infrastructure, this is all what was constructed uh, under the 20. 20 site plan approval. Um, so moving to the next sheet, this basically, uh, th this is a site plan um, that basically shows two illustrations. Um, in the main body of the site plan, uh, this is the proposed uh, 25,000 square foot school building. Again, this is the location where the uh, two-story medical office building was proposed. And again, that had a 20,000 square foot footprint. Uh, that previous site plan, uh, again, as approved in February of 2020, is in the lower right-hand corner. Uh, and you can see, uh, you know, the two buildings are in the same general location. Basically, we held the northerly building line and, and went to the south. And, and what this did was it eliminated a row of parking on the south side of the building. Um, the previous uh, approval, we were proposing uh, parking in that lower level of the building, um, but it, it doesn't appear that it's going to be feasible now, now that we have an expanded footprint, structural uh, requirements, depths of beams and so forth, uh, it, it seems there, there's not going to be enough, you know, clearance vertically uh, in that lower level. So we've had to delete uh, the parking in that lower level. Um, so going back to uh, the proposed one-story school building, uh, you'll notice uh, that there's no longer a port cochere uh, in the front of the building. Uh, instead, there'll be a uh, series of sidewalks uh, leading to the main door. Uh, and because this is a school, Porter and Chester, uh, they do have an automotive component uh, to their curriculum. Uh, there is a site drive uh, that leads into the building there. Uh, as part of the uh, approval process with wetlands, uh, we did delete uh, six parking spaces on the north side uh, of the building uh, and basically turn that into a larger uh, green area. Um, but all other uh, site circulation, access drives, fire lanes, uh, they all remain the same. 
Uh, and I'd like to move on to grading. Uh, again, as I mentioned, uh, you know, 90% of this site ha has been built. Um, so the proposed grades that are shown uh, around this uh, school building, basically they're the same as the previous site plan. Uh, in, in essence, uh, th there are about 5% grades uh, on both sides of the building. And again, the fire lane uh, in the rear of the building. Um, I, I should explain that there is a, as, as I mentioned, there is a lower level to this building. Um, and primarily what that lower level is gonna serve is uh, compensatory flood storage. Uh, so in, in the event of a flood, um, you know, and Goff Brook rises, the, the flood waters would flow through, uh, you know, gates, um, and, and the architect can explain this in, in his presentation in, in little more detail. So it basically flow in and, and flow out. So that, that grade in the rear of the building uh, is, uh, you know, one elevation there. Um, and again, that's consistent with uh, what was proposed uh, two years ago. Uh, in terms of site utilities, Again, I mentioned, uh, you know, all the major utility infrastructure was installed with phase one. Uh, that includes water, sewer, uh, electric, telecom, uh, gas. Uh, basically, it goes through the center of the site. Uh, the utility connections have been stubbed out uh, for this phase two building in the northeast corner. Um, we did uh, include uh, a, a grease oil, external grease oil separator on this plan, again, to handle the automotive uh, component for the school. Uh, the roof infiltrators uh, located on the south side of the building, these, these were revised, uh, expanded in length slightly to uh, accommodate the additional um, 5,000 square feet of, of roof area. Uh, so, uh, moving on to erosion and sedimentation controls, uh, again, with the rest of the site uh, built, stabilized, uh, you know, mitigation areas completed, uh, the, this dark area around the phase two building, we, we've included silt fencing around there, we have a construction entrance, uh, we, we have included silt sacks uh, in existing storm drainage structures in portions of the site that are already built. Uh, and for the one basin to be built behind the building. Uh, we do have the standard erosion and sedimentation control narrative, uh, both for during and uh, post-construction. Uh, moving to landscaping. Uh, again, uh, landscaping has been installed uh, throughout the parking area and around the phase one building uh, per the original uh, design plans. Uh, again, around the proposed school building, uh, deleting the Port Cochere, that changed uh, landscape treatment around that building, uh, the inset in the lower right-hand corner, uh, that shows the new landscape treatment. Uh, it basically consists of uh, a couple different types of broadleaf evergreens, more low ground cover type evergreens, uh, ornamental grasses, um, and, and a couple ornamental trees, paper bark maples. Uh, in terms of, but, but all the other landscaping, uh, you know, in, in those parking islands, uh, again, where, where the cursor is, uh, again, per plan uh, as previously approved from two years ago. Uh, in terms of site lighting, uh, again, lighting has been installed throughout the entire site. Uh, there are several wall mount fixtures to be located on uh, the proposed building. Uh, Apex Lighting did adjust locations on the proposed building uh, to uh, account for the additional uh, expanded footprint. And they had to slightly adjust location of two of the post-mounted luminaires in front of the building. Uh, they are full cutoffs. Uh, they're gonna match what's uh, in the site and what was previously uh, approved. Um, so, uh, with that, I think that gives you a quick overview, uh, of what the proposed site changes are. 
Uh, and at this point, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Mike Panic, uh, who's going to talk a little bit about parking. And then you'll hear from our traffic engineer, um, our project architect, and then I'll have a few things to sum up at the end. Uh, thank you, Kevin. For the record, Mike Panic, owner of the property at 1210 Silestein Highway. Uh, good evening and thank you for the opportunity. For my experience uh, at many meetings this close to the holiday, they're postponed, so I'm appreciative that uh, we were able to have a meeting. Uh, during my speech, Kevin from Close Jensen Miller will also screen share if available some of the info that uh, I'm going to be speaking about if possible, and I think you're set to do that, Kevin. <clears throat> uh, this commission, uh, and some of this might be repetitive to what Kevin opened up with, but I feel necessary to repeat at this time. Um, this commission in 2020 granted approval on the project, including the two proposed buildings and associated parking, landscaping, and all things associated with the project. At that time, when we came before you, we also had approvals from design review and inland wetlands. Now, some two years later, with the first building shell up and an eminent start to the interior fit up of building number one, we have negotiated with a second tenant, Porter and Chester Institute, currently in Rocky Hill, to build the second building. And since it's a change of use from medical to school, we needed again to gain approvals from the three commissions for this modification, which approvals have been obtained with design review and inland wetlands. The main difference other than the use change is the fact that the school needs to be on a one level 25,000 square foot footprint and our approval is for a 20,000 a 20,000 square foot uh, footprint. So thus uh, the approved two story 40,000 square foot building is now proposed to be a one story 25,000 square foot building. At the inland wetlands meeting prior to approval parking seemed to be a concern the town had but after deciding uh, as a commission that planning and zoning would be the best place to speak about parking, they approved the submission with the condition that this board would approve the need for the same amount of parking as previously approved with some minor adjustments. I intend to show you the calculations and back up that information uh, that we're presenting tonight. Uh, first, I'd like to turn back the clock to February of 2020, when in front of this board, I laid out my reasons uh, for being in the need of more parking than the town required for these buildings. I spoke that usually developers are asking for variances or waivers, which I heard previously uh, at tonight's meetings, to have less parking. And there I was, the needle in the haystack standing in front of you asking for more parking spaces. Parking does not generate revenue. Instead, it costs money for installation, for plowing, striping, pothole repair, crack sealing, and et cetera over the years. So it's not very beneficial, which is why most people ask for waivers for less parking. <clears throat> uh, at the time, the town engineer asked for supporting documentation to show the need for the extra parking for which there is no regulation or requirement, only for a minimum, no maximum. He suggested at the time two years ago that I refer to the ITE trip generation manual, manual which shows charts, averages, different use categories, sample sizes, et cetera, but then, as I do today, I prefer to use the actual on-site data from properties that I currently own. At the time, I presented facts derived from calculations provided to me at the time by Mark Vertucci, my traffic engineer, from the ITE parking generation manual number five, which is the standard and accepted rule of thumb before this commission. That presentation uh, that some you may remember, because I recognize some of the names and faces at tonight's meeting, uh, showed that a minimum six per thousand square feet calculation for metal use, medical use is in the current regulations. And the ITE found that 117 buildings that they surveyed um, had that six per thousand square foot calculation, but there were a few outliers that did register eight to 10 spaces per thousand. I then put up a graphic at the time that showed that it was ironic that of the 117 that the ITE had studied, I own three of the buildings in my portfolio, all medical buildings, two of them in Connecticut that have uh, that had those same higher thousands per uh, square feet, one having 13 spaces per thousand. I also offer my real experiences at 1260 Silestein Highway, another building I own directly in front of this property where cars circle a lot, sometimes multiple times 
looking for an open spot. Several commissioners at the time and at this uh, last week's Inland Wetlands meeting agreed that they were aware of this condition at 1260. After that presentation, at that time, the site was approved with 610 parking spaces. So tonight, <clears throat> I again, in an effort to show you that the approved parking plan with some modifications, including the change of use for building two is still viable and needed. I would like to offer the following information. <clears throat> in the past month or two, since we've been working on building two, <clears throat> There have been numbers that have been tossed around such as proposed spaces, needed spaces, original spaces, negotiated spaces, built spaces, to be built spaces, approved spaces. And what I like to deal with is actual spaces. Um, tonight, as in 2020, I would like to explain the actual number of spaces as the basis for my discussion, which after concurring uh, in person via email with the town engineer was concluded that there were 610 spaces approved at the planning and zoning meeting in 2020. See the screen share, uh, the email from the town engineer stating that it is not 612, but it's showing 610. So again, I'd like to go with actual spaces approved, 610. Moving forward, uh, I put up a map that I have from the time that is similar to the one Kevin uh, previously shown and this map, map shows actual spaces that were approved in 2020 the 610 which include in that 610 40 handicap spots this map shows all of the 610 parking spaces and for now while we have the map up i want to show you that we are deleting 50 spaces due to the building enlargement that kevin will show you the ones under the building in that row of 14 so those 50 are being eliminated and the six that he also mentioned that I highlighted in pink, showing the six that we're gonna turn into almost a thousand square feet of green space, uh, leaving 554 proposed for this submission, a 9% reduction in spaces from the 610 that were approved. Using that actual number of 610, we can now delineate and delegate those spaces as needed and show without a reasonable doubt that they are warranted and needed as previously approved. Using this chart, you can see that building one needs 320 spaces highlighted in green, showing the employee count, the doctors, the patients per hour, uh, and a slight increase from what was approved two years ago at building one, uh, because the in yellow, you'll see that the tenant has decided to um, not use the daycare center that was also part of the approval and turn that into uh, more of a medical use for them, I think as with the blacktop, daycare is not a, um, a profit-making venue for the medical building. And in the last two years, they've grown again. So they decided to also take on this chart where it says other tenant, 10,000 square feet. The current tenant is now gonna occupy 100% of the building. They are taking that additional 10,000 square feet, which doesn't change the parking calculation because we had already anticipated using the same numbers. So, um, one other side note to this is since they're not gonna have a daycare center, there's a, a, an area previously used outside as a playground space on the previous map and a map that I'm sure we'll bring up again that you'll see uh, that had possible non-pervious areas under playground equipment and things like that and swings and such. And now will be, uh, now be and already is a grassed area also adding to green space. <clears throat> now on the final chart, We'll get to how I get to the actual uh, showing the spaces needed. Thank you, Kevin. So in this chart, you can see again, actual spaces. You can see the 610 approved, highlighted in yellow. From that, we subtract the 50 spaces being lost by the building to footprint size change. The six space reduction to increase the green space on site that we agreed to at the Inland Wetlands meeting leaving an on-site balance of 554 as discussed. From 554, we subtract the already proven 320 spaces from building one, leaving 234 spaces available for building two. With the potential tenant Porter and Chester writing a letter at the town's request that was in your package, expressing that 
175 students could be on site in the daytime all and all at the same time, not staggered, and that staff and teachers could total 40, the actual need for building two is 215 spaces as shown in this diagram. <clears throat> Some things to remember, none of the students are bused to school. This is not a, a, an elementary school. This is a school for adults trying to retrain themselves. And unlike the suggestion that this be compared according to an ITE manual as a junior college, as was suggested, it's obvious that this does not act or work in that same schedule where students are coming and going during the day. Instead, this works more like a high school, this school, where all students gather once for the entire day. That said, 234 spaces <clears throat> minus the 215 that the, the uh, applicant, I mean, I'm sorry, that the tenant has told me that they need for their students and faculty, uh, that leaves an actual excess of 19 spaces. Call them actual extra. That's what we're gonna have if, if at the maximum capacity for both buildings, there'll be 19 free spaces. Okay, that doesn't take into account, and I wanna remind you that that, that's provided that all 40 cap handy spaces are utilized at all times. As soon as five handicap spaces are not used, I need five of those 19 spaces to accommodate people that are not handicapped because that 40 is included in that 610. Um, there's also uh, could be uh, in building one, there are drug reps and visitors that visit all the time. Um, there's maintenance and trade people that could be coming to the building, dropping off supplies and things like that. Uh, so uh, we also have, I didn't write on this sheet, but we also have potential students that could be coming to building two to apply to get into the school that won't be part of the school population daily, but could come on any given day. If there's an enrollment period, we could have people at the building. There's some people that could travel uh, to medical building one that could need to be transported to the hospital at hap as happens at 1260 Silas Dean at the front building. Um, and they leave their car for an extended time. That'll, that could tie up a spot where those 19 again could be needed. Um, it also could be conceived that since 1260 and building number one that's currently up are the same tenant, there could be overflow from that lot at 1260 into 1210 after people circle for a while. So there's also a potential that that could happen. Um, uh, so uh, let's see, where was I? Sorry. Spaces we allow use need a daily basis. And a calculation of 19 extra spaces on a 554 actual parking spaces, I don't believe is very unreasonable given these bullet points on this showing uh, potential for where those spaces could be needed. Um, so, and I don't think the town really wants me to build another property that has that same possibility of students and or uh, faculty and or patients to building one circling around in circles and then potentially parking on Mill Street or parking somewhere. I just don't think the town wants me to build that again. And, and I don't want to build that again. Uh, summing it up on parking, the need is real. Healthcare is booming. Jobs and job training is critical. And the potential for these two businesses to thrive is expected. And the parking lot will be filled for years to come. I believe with all this information and backup, this now demonstrates the need for the amount of parking without any doubt. With any further reduction in parking or converting to future use has been, been suggested or building it with other kind of materials, but blacktop uh, being done could be detrimental to the project and impact the tenant's choice to proceed. Uh, and I really don't think that it would be uh, possible or, or that the town would be interested in the possibility of not having this tenant for a few parking spots. It just, it doesn't make a, a, a lot of sense to me. I hope the commissioners will again, as in 2020, see and understand the need on an actual basis and approve my submission. Second and lastly, I'd like to just touch quickly on low impact development because that also came up. As part of the approval process two years ago, we did a number of things to address questions at the design review level, at the Inland Wetlands Commission level, and at the planning and zoning level to provide alternatives, including adding new islands that are currently on site and built. Um, sorry, every time I try to look up to these, I lose my spot. Um, at the point to provide all, including adding new islands, decreasing parking to add a snow storage area on the property, which is existing and built. We have also built new wetlands areas, cleaned up existing wetland areas, 
We've added water collection structures to collect the roof uh, water runoff and enlarged islands to reduce blacktop as answers to the town engineer's comments two years ago. All part of our approval then, all of the substantial cost and an increase to the project, uh, but we did it. Um, since it was approved and built phase one, I see no reason for the town to now say that this is a, an entirely new project. It is a change of use and our submission shows that no new impacts are going to happen at the wetlands traffic or the community level. After two meetings and much discussion within the wetlands commissions, we are now limited since what exists today was built under those approvals from two years ago. The areas we could even start to approach LID features within that limited areas. And as Kevin said, the balance of the to be built parking in the area where we need to do it is at a 5% grade. That's not conducive to putting in any kind of alternative non-blacktop parking. The balance of the parking that is left to do is all around building two and would be considered in my mind, premium parking because it's the closest to the building, uh, which we now adjusted as once said by eliminating six of those parking spaces as part of a project to make sure that the, uh, as part of a plan to show the town and the inland wetlands that you know we're concerned and we're trying to be reasonable. Uh, and finally, the area behind building two is the only flat area and which would have been best for pervious pavers. But after discussing with the town fire marshal, he will not approve of this as it impacts the need for his fire apparatus and accessibility. That correspondence is also part of your package. Um, and, and lastly, in that same area, draining water into that area with purview pavers would leach behind the large segmental block wall that's at the river's edge and is not conducive in the area after speaking to our wall engineer for the wall that's currently built. In finalizing this section, LID, we have made every reasonable effort both two years ago and now on this project and have considered have certainly tried to maximize the extent practicable, which is the language that's used in the current regulations. I want to thank you again for listening to this presentation. And at this point, I would like to turn it over to my traffic engineer, Mark Vertucci, for further discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. Great. All right. Thank you. Uh, again, I'm Mark Vertucci, Senior Transportation Engineer at Fuss and O'Neill. I'm a registered professional engineer and uh, professional traffic operations engineer as well. Uh, we did prepare a traffic impact statement uh, dated December 6th, and uh, the purpose of this statement uh, was just to, to look at the traffic generation from the um, uh, proposed uh, workforce training center here versus uh, the 25,000 square foot uh, border in Chester versus what was previously uh, proposed, which was the 40,000 square foot uh, medical office building. So we looked at the, uh, the traffic generation of both. Uh, we looked at rates in the uh, Institute of Transportation Engineers Generation Manual 11th edition, which is an industry resource for determining traffic generation uh, for various land uses. So. Uh, we looked at land use code 720 for medical dental office. Uh, for the Porter and Chester, however, there is no um, a land use uh, in there for a workforce training center. Um, so, you know, not having that, that land use data, the next best thing really would be to go and try and count a similar facility or similar Porter and Chester in the area. Um, unfortunately, all of the the nearby facilities are all part of larger mixed use developments. So uh, really couldn't get an accurate trip count um, as the, the traffic streams are all mixed with the other uses. Uh, so what we had to do is, is look at ITE and, and try to look for a, a somewhat comparable use to uh, ascertain what the traffic generation might be from the, uh, the workforce training centers. So we, we looked at land use code 540, a junior community college uh, not a, a really a perfect comparison given a lot of the data in there was uh, a much uh, much larger uh, you know facilities the colleges are have a lot more students and a lot more square footage but uh, we did check those numbers and what we actually came up with for the traffic generation uh, seemed pretty reasonable based on the um, number of students and the number of faculty that uh, Porter and Chester has indicated will be on this site. Uh, 
175 students and up to 40 faculty. Uh, using that rate, uh, we get uh, 95 vehicle trips in the morning peak hour and 75 vehicle trips in the afternoon peak hour. So, uh, when you consider this is the, the peak hour and you know people come into the site before the peak hour and gradually build up to the peak hour and then you know taper off after the peak hour or maybe it's a you know a four hour period when they come in and out um, you get that you know that peak rate makes sense uh, versus uh, what we have for the number of, of students there. So we're pretty comfortable with the traffic generation projection there, uh, even using the college rate. Um, when you look at the medical office on the morning peak hour, we would have had 124 trips. So versus 95 with a Porter and Chester, that's a net reduction in 29 trips. In the afternoon peak hour, we would have had 160 trips for the medical office and with the Porter and Chester, it's 25 with a net reduction. So, uh, the takeaway here is this is a less intense use uh, and it's going to generate uh, less trips uh, during uh, the peak hours than, than what the previous use would, would have been. Um, now, we, this letter did not address parking, but I know there have been uh, concerns raised on the amount of parking being proposed and you know, Mike did a very good job describing, uh, describing everything here. And, uh, the need based on the actual operational data provided by uh, Porter and Chester, but um, I, I did look at it independently. Um, you know, again, uh, the letter that, that uh, Porter and Chester provided back on November 29th indicated 175 students and up to 40 faculty. That's up to 215 people maximum on the site uh, at one time. Um, so, you know, based on the fact we're here in a very uh, suburban location on the Silas Dean Highway. Um, I would not anticipate many of these, um, uh, many of the people, the students and the faculty coming to the site uh, are going to arrive in anything but a, you know, a personal vehicle or a passenger car. There's really no bike, bicycle or pet facilities in the area. Um, there is some transit, uh, but I would expect that number to be uh, fairly low. Um, so I think, you know, maximum demand wise, uh, 215 people, 215 spaces, that would be your, your maximum you could expect here on the site at one time. I did do a similar exercise where I looked at uh, ITE rates uh, for parking. Now there's a totally different manual uh, for parking generation that ITE has. Uh, it's a different manual than trip generation. Uh, it's the parking generation manual fifth edition. It has a whole different data set. Um, trip generation and parking generation are two very different calculations, very different methodologies. Um, so what I did in, again, looking in ITE, again, there was no land use for the workforce training center. So we had to look for the next closest use and the land uses are similar in the parking generation manual. So I <clears throat> went and again, looked at that junior community college land use rate and land use code 540 in the manual. And what we saw again was a lot of the, the data taken uh, for that land use was for much larger facilities. The average uh, community college size was uh, 12,000 students, uh, 740 employees, and the average square footage was 460,000 square feet. Um, you know, obviously our facility is much smaller, it's 25,000 square feet and 175 students. So, Demand rates in there are what I'm finding is they're not yielding accurate results for, for the facility that's um, you know as small as what we have. And just to give you a, a point of reference, um, when we look at students uh, um, using the calculation for the the parking manual community college rate, the number of students for 175 it comes out that we would need 35 parking spaces using a fitted curve equation and 75 spaces using, using 85th percentile rate. So these are obviously drastically lower than the operational data that's provided to us by uh, Porter and Chester. So not comfortable at all with those rates. Uh, if you look at it on a square footage basis for 25,000 square feet, I'm, I'm getting a parking demand of 548 spaces based on the fitted curve equation. So you know, stratospherically high on that, and, uh, and you look at it on an employee count and the fitted curve equation uh, is given 308 spaces. So um, 
too high, too low, the numbers are all over the place and we're not getting accurate um, uh, you know, projection here using the IT parking generation manual. Uh, so unlike with the trip generation calculation, which is again, different manual, different data, I am not recommending, strongly do not recommend using the IT parking generation manual here uh, to determine the amount of parking capacity that should be provided on the site. Um, you know, the next best thing again is to is to try to count another facility. Again, I can't we can't do that because the Porter and Chester's in the area are built into other mixed use uh, developments. So I it's hard to ascertain where the people are parking in those in those developments, whether they're from the Porter and Chester or something else. Um, so the best available data that we have is the operational data provided by the end user Porter and Chester and they're they're telling us uh, in their letter on November 29th that there will be uh, a maximum of 175 students and 40 uh, faculty and staff, which would yield uh, 215 people and a, and a maximum parking demand of, of 215. And that is that is the best data and the most reasonable data we have to go by here. So um, in, in my professional opinion, that's the number of parking spaces that should be provided on this site. Uh, the industry <laughs> standard industry standard is inappropriate to use um, in that calculation. Um, and that was that was all I wanted to hit on. I certainly taking a, answers to the questions when we're done with the presentation, but I think I have another speaker to, to follow here. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, Kevin, who's next? Uh, Charlie, are you there? Charlie Nyberg? Charlie? He's there, but he's muted. I'm trying to give him hand signals. I'm unmuted. All right, hey. can you hear me? Yeah, now we can. Very good, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> members of the commission, Charles Nyberg, the office, Shadler Selnow at 5 Waterville Road in uh, Farmington. <clears throat> we were the architects for the uh, first building as well as being in attendance at your approval for the uh, site plan for both of the buildings that have been discussed. The first uh, plate that uh, uh, has been put up is the, uh, uh, let's see, that would be the plan for the lower level of the building. Uh, it'll basically be a reinforced concrete retaining wall structure uh, as has been mentioned, we have a situation of <clears throat> water flow in and water flow out. We have set up architecturally a series of openings across the west uh, wall of that elevation, which will have <clears throat> a wrought iron look grill, which will prevent access for uh, people and or vehicles, <clears throat> but will allow water to uh, flow in hopefully no obviously major debris to get in and then water to flow out. <clears throat> the slab in that area, the floor in that area will be concrete. Uh, the, uh, as I mentioned, the structure itself is concrete. We do have, <clears throat> and you'll see it in the floor plan, uh, we have an exit stair at the northwest corner of the building, which will provide a second means of egress from our upper level. Uh, we also have at the front of the building, which is to the east, in the lower uh, left-hand corner, it's not quite at the corner, is a uh, space that will form the ramp that will allow vehicle access into the uh, aforementioned auto uh, area of the first floor for car repair. Uh, the, second, uh, the second drawing, <coughs> Kevin, uh, is the uh, is the grid similar to what was already discussed? There'll be a series of of uh, columns in that lower level. Uh, we haven't gotten to determine with our client at this point or our structural engineer as to what those columns will be constructed of, whether they will be steel and or concrete. Uh, that will be something we will be getting into uh, once we have an approval. The next drawing 
was what we presented to DRAC, uh, which was basically a blank floor plan of the upper level and were reprimanded by uh, the chairman for not including a schematic floor plan of that uh, layout for Porter and Chester. Uh, we are doing, as the architect Shadler Cell now, we are doing the base building. The fit out is being done by new interiors from Farmington who do a, uh, who, who work on layouts for uh, Porter and Chester. So there's two architects involved. We doing the uh, base building shell and new interiors doing the uh, fit out. The next drawing shows a schematic representation of the departments that uh, will become part of the curriculum that will be offered in this location. Uh, the automotive section is at the, is at the right side. Uh, the uh, plumbing and water section is to the extreme right. I will profess I have not at this point uh, gotten into a full understanding of all of the subtleties of their layout. Suffice to say that uh, <clears throat> New Interiors has worked with Porter Chester before, and uh, this layout will uh, meet the intent of their requirements for this location, as well as the exiting requirements from the uh, upper level. Again, the stair mentioned before in the upper uh, northeast, northwest corner uh, will become a second means of egress that will go down to grade at that lower level. Uh, we have a front door entrance uh, at the front of the building, as well as another uh, man door uh, entrance exit from the area of the automotive shop. <clears throat> the next drawing is, are the elevations of the building. Uh, this is going to be similar in architecture to what we did with the first building uh, one of the things that we didn't do with the first building that we should have was some modulation of the uh, roof line, uh, which we have done with this one. Uh, colors will be the same, EFIS materials. We have a stone uh, base uh, as we have with the existing uh, single story, 40,000 square foot building uh, using the same stone material and color. The uh, darker uh, EFIS colors will pop forward of the lighter EFIS colors by a minimal dimension. And one of the things that DRAC had asked for, which we hadn't shown, were those elements being carried through to the stone. And we now have, we have done that. We have prepared, which have not been provided as far as this exercise but I've done some wall sections which show how all of that will function. And as we get into the development of our construction documents, uh, we'll follow through with the uh, request of DRAC to provide for uh, that consideration. The, uh, that drawing that is being shown, uh, the top is the full elevation across the east side of the building. And then we included a section, an enlarged section to the uh, left, which shows the overhead uh, door uh, for the uh, auto entrance area into that auto section of the main level, as well as to the right of that, the aforementioned uh, man door uh, that will lead again to the automotive section. The next drawing, shows the west elevation and uh, shows the openings with the uh, grading, the enlarged drawing below it probably gives you a little bit better view of that situation. Uh, one of the things that I am changing slightly is that that stone, uh, which again, in discussion with DRAC, the stone base will run consistently across the west elevation below the windows instead of dropping down to where the, uh, that darker band of EFIS is shown. Uh, but there's a series of openings that relate to 
uh, the architecture up above will have the wrought iron look grating, which will allow water in and water out, but no people and or debris to get into that lower level. Uh, we will have off of that stair uh, exit, we will have an air a way to get someone into that lower level location for basically just a maintenance look. And if something, let's say, were to happen with uh, plumbing and or in a need to be able to access the lower level uh, underside of the main floor for leaking, plumbing or whatever, we would be able to uh, remove a grill and be able to gain access to that location. As Kevin had mentioned, as this has evolved, there is not enough room below structure to make it a meaningful, usable space. So again, it's a water in, water out situation. On this elevation, you can also see that we have scupper boxes. Uh, the roof, as with the existing building, is a single slope. The existing building pitches from north to south. This building will pitch, the roof will pitch from east to west. And we have scupper boxes to be able to take our water uh, off the roof into an underground system. Uh, and as you can see, uh, we also are concerned that we will have mechanical equipment up on the roof and our parapet uh, will be able to conceal that. If you see where the scupper box is exiting, uh, there's about a four foot and generally about a four foot change of elevation. And then when we get to the pop-up, it probably goes up to about five to six. So there will be ample screening of mechanical equipment from that uh, west side of the building towards the Silas Dean Highway. The next drawing is the elevation to the uh, north, uh, showing the pitch of the grade from upper level on the left down to the lower level on the west side, on the right side of that elevation. And again, what we did was an enlargement of that elevation on the uh, left-hand corner. And as you can see the lines where the brown ephus is located, there are now lines that are running down to and through the stone, which again was a DRAC requirement. They wanted to see that that visual sort of load, if you would, was being carried to grade. We did not have that before. So we have added that as their, uh, their request. And then the final drawing the final drawing is the uh, south elevation, similar to the north side of the building uh, with the same comments about uh, the stone base and the ephus and what have you. Uh, Porter and Chester has asked for windows in these locations to be higher than normal because they wanted to use the wall area for uh, racking and uh, their school needs. So that's why the windows on those two elevations are higher than uh, typical. The next plate are two perspectives. The upper perspective is looking from the, what would be the uh, south, uh, west, yeah, southwest corner, looking across the uh, water in, water out areas where the grills are. And then the up the lower elevation is looking uh, northwest. Uh, the uh, uh, door into the shop area, the uh, automotive area, and then moving to the right is the entrance. Uh, and there will probably be uh, some signage on that elevation, which will have to be approved uh, by the uh, by the commission or however this needs to happen in terms of. Uh, getting a site plan approval, I will probably say Porter Chester Institute or something like that. I think, Kevin, that was my set of drawings, I believe. I, I believe so. Okay. So I again, I would just restate a, a couple of items that Mike has mentioned regarding the uh, existing building. Uh, we have done the uh, 40,000 square foot layout for Starling. Uh, that building, the, the drawings have gone out to bid 
We have received bids. We have made a recommendation to Starling about selecting a contractor and hopefully work will start on that uh, sometime at the beginning of the year. The uh, item that I wanted to mention as he had discussed was the playground. Again, they had talked about and we had approval for it, a daycare center as they evolved their thinking. Uh, they decided that that was not something that the staff really would make use of. Uh, or so much of the staff would make use of it that they wouldn't have enough daycare. Uh, so that green area is still a green area. The only thing that will be out there will probably be a piece of equipment for radiology, which has taken uh, the space, some of the space that was going to be for the daycare center. Uh, I answer any questions that you may have and thank you again for allowing us to make the presentation. Merry Christmas. I have some questions, Mr. Chairman. George Oikel here. Uh, uh, who selected yeah. the light brown color for this, these buildings and are they compatible with other buildings in the area color-wise? They will be compatible with the building on our site. They what? They will, be, they will be the same colors as the Is building. Is the other building on site? Yes. Yes. Okay. I don't like the light brown, of course, but I, if it matches the other building and even the ones out front, I, you know, that's fine. I'll go along with it. Yeah, no, there was no, again, what we were trying to do was to, you know, I know when we first had our DRAC meeting on the whole project, uh, there were some comments about, uh, you know, trying to replicate or be sympathetic to some of the uh, buildings that are on Silasteen Highway. And my comments had been that this is a site almost unto itself. Yes, it's off of Silas Dean. Oh, uh, it, it is. But it's, uh, it's, uh, set, it's set way back. And we we're trying to establish right. our own uh, look, if you would, our own architectural look. Uh, the one thing that I didn't do that I will say that I should have done with the existing building was to have some uh, modulation of the roof line. Uh, I'm pretty pleased with the way it came out in general, and I think Mike is also, but it could have stood for a little bit of movement on the roof and that, along with the need, as this building backs up to the Silas Dean Highway, we need to have some screening of our rooftop equipment. That's most important. Whereas the existing building, the back side of the building to the south is open. Uh, if you walk around the south or drive around the south side of the building, you will see the gutter line below the parapet. You can't see the mechanical equipment unless you were further, further south, uh, you know, off the property. But again, with the building as visual as it will be from Silas Dean, we needed to do something to screen the equipment, which we have done. Yes, you should, because this town is very concerned with rooftop uh, equipment and uh, disguising it the best you can. Of yes. course, this gets back from the Silas Dean enough. I don't think you're going to see much of that, but, you know, be concerned with it. Okay, can I interject for one second? Mike Panic again, the owner. Uh, before we get into uh, questions and answers, I think I'd like to have Kevin just summarize a little bit everything that you've heard tonight. Kevin? Yeah, the, the only other thing I would ask is that if, you, if you're if you done, that you stop screen sharing so that we can see what's going on here. Sorry. Go ahead, thank Kevin. You, thank you, Charlie, and thank you, Mike. Um, yeah, I just have a few final comments. Uh, this is a special permit, so I'd like to go over um, some of the special permit criteria um, as per Article uh, 8 of your zoning regulations. Um, so Article 8.1, uh, this basically deals with suitable location. Uh, it talks about location, size of the proposed use or activity uh, will be in harmony with the orderly development of the area, uh, that the nature and intensity of the use or activity in relation to the size of the lot um, I, I think we just touched on a lot of that. Um, you know, a, a school use is allowed in the RC zone. Um, this is a 25,000 square foot building on a 12.6 uh, acre lot. 
uh, as you just heard from the architect, uh, this building architecture is compatible uh, with the medical office building um, and, and the other, you know, you know, some of the other medical office buildings Mr. Panic owns on Silas Dean Highway. Uh, 8.2, uh, neighborhood compatibility, uh, that the design elements of the proposed development are attractive and suitable uh, in relation to the site characteristics, style of other buildings in the immediate area, uh, that the proposed use uh, will not alter the essential characteristics of the area or adversely affect property values, uh, that adequate provision is made for the maintenance of the proposed development. Uh, again, we just discussed the architecture and uh, proximity to other Silas Dean office buildings and, and the existing phase one building. Uh, the, 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 the owner is investing uh, close to $15 million uh, in, in building improvements alone. Um, you know, and this doesn't include uh, the infrastructure improvements and, and so forth. Um, you know, the, again, you remember this was a former warehouse site um, and, and, you know, this is all new infrastructure. Um, in, in terms of maintenance uh, of the proposed development, uh, I, I think you can see from other properties, Mr. Panic owns in town as well as 1260. Uh, I, I think he's got a proven track record, uh, you know, for, for, you know, keeping the properties, uh, you know, in tip top shape. Uh, 8.3, appropriate structures and landscaping. Uh, this talks about the, the kind, size, location, height, uh, design of any other structures, uh, and the extent of the landscaping in the lot are appropriate for the proposed activity and for the site, uh, that the proposed structures would not hinder or discourage uh, the appropriate use of adjoining property or again, diminish value thereof. Um, I, again, uh, I think we've shown that the proposed structures and landscaping uh, have been reviewed uh, by design review, not just once, but twice, you know, two years ago. Uh, you know, again, I think I mentioned previously, you know, probably close to 90% of the proposed site improvements have been installed, including landscaping and the phase one building uh, is in place. Um, and, and we don't think, uh, you know, anything that we're proposing here is going to hinder the use of any adjoining, uh, property, uh, article 8.4 suitable access and parking. Uh, this, this, uh, talks about streets providing access to the proposed use or activity or adequate and width grade alignment, uh, that the entrance and exit driveways are laid out to achieve maximum safety, uh, that the proposed use or activity will have easy accessibility for fire apparatus, police protection, uh, and parking and loading facilities are adequate and properly located. Uh, there's, there's nothing that we're proposing here uh, that's gonna change anything regarding the Silestine Highway or Mill Street. Uh, they are of adequate width. Uh, again, the approved site plan from two years ago, the, the uh, driveway access has already been constructed from Mill Street. Uh, and it connects with the Puritan Drive. So we've created this through, uh, you know, access driveway through the entire site. Um, you know, I, I think if anything, we've, uh, you know, increased uh, site circulation. Uh, 8.5, uh, again, this is overall circulation, uh, that the proposed use or activity will not impede implementation of the uh, circulation plan of the way there's a plant of the circulation plan, excuse me, of the Weatherfield Plan of Conservation and Development. Uh, again, as I just mentioned, uh, you know, we created that access drive. Uh, we're not doing anything to change any local roadways or state roadways. Uh, Article 8.6, adequate public utilities, uh, water supply, sewage disposal, stormwater drainage shall conform with accepted engineering practices. Uh, I, I think Again, I mentioned, uh, you know, all the new uh, utility infrastructure is currently in place in conformance with the site plan uh, this commission approved two years ago. Um, and again, as I, I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, stormwater management system is in place, uh, including water quality structures, uh, you know, roof infiltration systems and, and so forth. Um, 
Article 8.7, Environmental Protection and Conservation. Uh, that the proposed plans have provided for the conservation of natural features, drainage basins, protection of the environment, uh, sustained maintenance of the development. Uh, you've heard a couple times tonight from myself and Mr. Panic. Um, you know, we did go through wetlands two years ago. Uh, there was a mitigation plan associated uh, with that. Uh, that mitigation area has been completed, uh, planted. Uh, there was a letter issued by the soil scientist in the fall of this year that uh, it's in conformance uh, you know, and everything is in conformance with the original design plans from two years ago and, and stable. Uh, there's been ongoing removal of invasive species. Uh, again, the water quality structures to treat the storm runoff from the parking area are in place. Uh, again, I mentioned the infiltration system and I did go over uh, the full erosion and sedimentation plans and measures uh, to govern the phase two work. Uh, Article 8.8, .8, consistent with purposes. Uh, this, this talks about uh, the proposed use or activity will not have any detrimental effects upon the public health, safety, or welfare. Uh, that the proposed use will not conflict with the purposes of the regulations. Uh, it will further uh, the goals, objective, and policies uh, plan of conservation and development. Uh, again, I think I've touched on, you know, several of these already, um, you know, we're replacing an, an old warehouse with new multi-million dollar buildings. Um, and uh, Article 8.9, other considerations uh, that the location type of signs or lighting uh, are compatible with these considerations. Uh, the use activity will provide adequate landscaping and screening, uh, appropriate provisions for pedestrians, bicyclists, uh, handicapped persons uh, within the development and along public streets, that the use will enhance community development, uh, not result in excessive numbers or proximity of like uses, incompatibility with neighboring uses, so forth. Uh, that the use will not have a negative impact on neighboring towns or on the region. Uh, so again, I, I mentioned in my presentation with the, regarding the lighting, uh, it is full cutoff. It was previously approved. Uh, the majority of that uh, is already in place. Uh, the, the lighting to still be installed with phase two will be compatible uh, in the same fixtures as phase one. Uh, the landscaping, again, I mentioned, uh, it's been installed with the, in accordance with the previous site plan. Uh, in terms of pedestrians and bicyclists, uh, again, we have sidewalks that are connecting to Mill Street uh, to the north and the former Puritan driveway uh, to the south. Uh, again, there's a striped area through the entire center of the site, uh, which connects these sidewalk systems. And, and that was installed as per uh, the approved site plans from two years ago. And we also have included a bicycle rack uh, in these current plans as, as we did with the phase one building. Um, we discussed enhancement uh, of community development. Uh, again, uh, we removed a former warehouse and, and replaced uh, with brand new buildings, multi-million dollar buildings uh, that are gonna generate substantial tax dollars for the town of Wethersfield. Um, and this, this, we do not feel will have a negative impact on any neighboring towns. Uh, so with that, uh, that concludes my comments and uh, myself and, and the team will be happy to answer any questions commission members may have. All right, thanks very much. Um, does anyone on the commission have any questions for the, the applicant or and their representatives. Mr. So Chairman, I, I have a question. Sure, Pete. Uh, Kevin, maybe this is to you. I, I know you mentioned this, I don't know if I caught it. In the beginning, you stated that I think the former building had parking underneath, but this building could not accommodate that and I don't remember the reason why. Could you explain what changed, why this building cannot be built to accommodate 
parking underneath? Well, well, the former building was 5,000 square feet smaller. Um, you know, I, I think at the time, uh, two years ago, not a lot of detail, you know, studies or thought had gone into that. Um, there weren't as many columns uh, needed to support that structure. Now with a, uh, an expanded footprint, um, you know, it, it requires different column placements. So it's really not practical, number one, for, um, you know, to create circulation drives and the parking spaces with the number of columns. And, and I think you saw those on the architectural plans. Um, also, it, it, it's a vertical, um, you know, and, and again, uh, Mr. Nyberg can, you know, elaborate on that, but I believe he said it's going to be a five inch concrete floor, uh, upwards of two feet of structural beams. Uh, and then, you know, there'll be some pipes below that, uh, water and sanitary, you know, insulated pipes, you know, that will be hung from there. So, you know, we have about a nine foot differential between finished floor and that lower level. So when you start to subtract that, you, you know, you're going to end up with maybe a little over six feet, you know, of clearance. I mean, I, I'm six foot four, I'd probably barely be able to stand up down there. So between structural requirements, placement of columns, it's, it's really not practical for the parking below there. Couldn't you just raise the building? Well, th then you start to get into, I mean, it's already, you know, elevated, you know, artificially to get above the floodplain. Um, you know, you've got the accessibility, the handicapped and so forth. Um, you know, now with the drive component for the automotive, it, it's already, I think, um, like a 5% grade on that driveway. So, you know, you, you start to get out into other issues, lifting that building more. Yeah, no, I, I understand, you know, the costs and all that. Uh, I guess my only thinking is that uh, there seems to be a, a little bit of a debate going on and how many parking you need. And by the way, uh, the applicant, you know, Mike, you did a great job explaining it. And I, I think it makes sense. I mean, I'm not questioning at all your numbers. I, they make sense to me. And, and, and just in the spirit of compromise between green space and parking space, I was wondering if there's any way to put parking space underneath. That, that was the nature of my question. If you have to raise the building a little bit, and it doesn't cost that much more, and you, you know, for what you save on not putting the parking outside, could you simply just raise the elevation of the building a little bit, another foot? I mean, not too many people are seven feet tall. So, uh, you know, is, is that, that something that's, that's where the nature of the question was? Uh, Charlie. Uh, oh, so I can elaborate on that a little bit, and then I'll give it back to you, Charlie. I, I okay. think the answer is simply, this project was uh, monumentally expensive uh, to, to complete. Uh, we did add a lot of the things that were spoken about tonight. We've also ran into some things during the project that have elevated the cost. And with the cost of steel, it's not only raising the building, but raising the building would not change. And Charlie can back me up if this is not true, but it's my, my interpretation that raising the building, the columns underneath the building will not move in different directions, meaning that when you drove in there, you'd be like driving into with columns everywhere. And unlike what was proposed previously, where the columns gave a layout for parking, the column placement in order to build this size building, no matter how tall it is, have to be where they have to be. And then driving around in columns underneath the building is, is not going to be practical. And we, we wouldn't gain as many, any spaces really with the new layout. And, Charlie can elaborate if needed, but I think that it was pretty well documented in his proposed uh, plan with where the columns were going to be. That it's just not it, it's not conducive for parking with columns everywhere. Many more than were shown two years ago because of the size uh, expansion. I, I would agree. I think that what had happened two years ago is that. We had laid it out with the parking in mind with column spacing. Uh, which I think we were looking at it as almost a podium where we set up a separate structure that we built a structure below that allowed for parking uh, with a concrete podium and then built the two stories above it. Although what I'd like to think happened, and I think what really happened was that 
we when we we were thinking more about the first building than we were about the second building and we perhaps didn't look fully at the grade differentiation between what uh and i don't know how much different it was originally from our finished floor now to where we have the entrance to that lower level but clearly we do not have enough room uh, to be able to put parking in of any meaningful height, as well as achieving uh, uh, plumbing and whatever else might be necessary. And again, I think as Kevin has indicated to raise the building a foot is probably not even enough. It would probably almost have to be two feet. And at that point, you then have such a tremendous, you know, if we're at a 5% grade from high to low, it's gonna be outrageous uh, going from uh, a east side down to that uh, lower driveway. So I think it's just a confluence of items that came up. And right now it is, it's beneficial for that area to be used for water in, water out. And I think Mike has proven that the spaces still work with the reduction that he has noted. Uh, those spaces go away. Uh, they don't really matter, I guess, to the total. So I think that, uh, I, again, I don't know what happened way back two years ago in terms of our thinking, but right now it clearly doesn't, it clearly doesn't work to provide parking on that lower level. Right. And just one, one other question, the water in, water out concept that you talked about. So if I understand correctly, they're just going to be open grates and water just flows in and out. There's no pumping or anything involved, is there? No, it's just it's just a natural. If the brook floods, the water will flow in. It may be a foot, it may be six inches, it may be two feet. I mean, who knows how much, uh, but basically it flows in and it will recede at some point. And uh, we have nothing down there. Uh, originally, one of the thoughts when we first started the exercise, before we realized two years ago or two and a half years ago, we were even thinking of putting an elevator down to that lower level, because if we were going to have parking, we could use that for people in the building, doctors or whatever, using that lower level for usable parking. Uh, but then when we realized, when we finally got in with Kevin and the flood and, and just sort of the water situation, we could not put an elevator down there. And, uh, you know, we, we have a stair that will drop uh, at a elevation that will not be subject to uh, initially water in, but at some point uh, will be high enough. Again, I guess if there was, let's put it this way, I guess if there were a substantial amount of water, uh, they'd probably end up and I would, I, I would say this, that that roadway that comes from Silas Dean to the site would be closed because it would be covered with water. And that building, those buildings would not be able to be used until the water receded. All right. Very good. Understand. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thanks, Rich. Anybody else on the commission have questions for the applicant? Joe. Thanks um, for um, Mark Vertucci, the, the traffic engineer. I'm, I'm looking at the staff memo from uh, the assistant town planner and town engineer dated today on um, page two, paragraphs one and two. And I guess as I'm reading that and looking at the application, it 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 looks like the applicant is saying for purposes of how many parking spaces we need don't use the ITE parking count information because that's not enough spaces for us. But for the traffic impact analysis, it looks like they are using the ITE lower numbers, you know, rather than the, the morning maximum 175 students and 40 faculty and staff who might all be there at once, and I think staff is saying that if you're if you're assuming 175 plus 40, all it would revise the the traffic report. And, and I guess my my question is also looking at the letter from Porter and Chester. If you know if if all of those people are there in the morning for a class, you know that starts at nine o'clock or eight o'clock or whatever, um, th doesn't that mean that 
215 people may be getting there all during a, si a single hour. And uh, rather than looking at 95 peak trips in the AM, shouldn't we be looking at uh, 215 trips? Yeah, it's a good good question. Um, so the the trip generation and parking generation, they're you know they're they're often confused that they're you know they're uh, analogous to each other, but um, you know they're really they're, they're completely different. Uh, calculation. So the parking generation uh, is, you know, the, the calculation is the maximum number of spaces, maximum demand that it's going to be on the site. So you need to provide parking for the highest number of people you're going to have on the site. So that typically occurs in the middle of the day. Um, and for this, this type of development, that's when it's going to occur in the midday. You're going to have all those people on there. You got to provide the parking. The trip generation is only the um, it's the peak hour trip generation that we're that we're uh, we're calculating here. So it's just the highest in the, the peak hour in the morning, the highest hour in the afternoon. So when you have a use like this, or uh, really any school type use, you get people that they don't all come in a you know 15, 20, 30 minutes. They the teachers get there first, students start to arrive. There's a peak, and then then it goes back down. It's like a parabola. You know, you don't have everybody coming at once. They they may arrive between say seven and ten in the morning. I mean, this is a uh, a trade school. <laughs> you have different uh, uses in the school. They're they're not all following the, the you know the exact same class schedule. Um, so you know, yeah, I mean, it's, I think, it's, it's go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. No, no. That, that, I, I was just going to say that right you know I think what the what the the memo I guess as I'm reading it is saying. You know, the letter from Porter and Chester just says assume 215 people all at once and that that would be in the morning because it was slightly lower in the afternoon. So I understand what you're saying about the distinction between the parking and traffic um, impact data in the ITE, but it seems if we're relying on the Porter and Chester letter and we have to assume they are all there at once and they need 215 parking spaces all at once. You know, so maybe maybe that 215 gets spread over two, you know, I, I don't know exactly how it works, but it seems to me if all that is the way it's gonna work, you know, that it could be substantially more peak trips than the 95, maybe it's not 215, but I just wanna make sure, you know, we're not gonna have problems because you got other medical uses and, and lots of activity yeah. in that area. Yeah, yeah, they, from my understanding of their operations, they're not all gonna come at once. They're, they're gonna, you may have, you know, 7 a.m., you may have 10 trips, then 8 a.m., 40, then, you know, then you're up to 90 and back down to 40 and 10. Like I said, it's kind of like a, a parabola. It's a cumulative thing. And then by midday, you're at 100%, you've got the full, you know, 215 people there, and then they, you know, they taper down again in the afternoon. So, I mean, that uh, that it, was the, the, that was another comment. I think you know from the town engineer that the Porter and Chester letter did not go into the schedule mm -hmm. of classes or how people arrive over time. So, I mean, I think that would have been helpful information to have to be able to make sure that we're all comfortable with the traffic impact. Yeah, I think you know it's 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 the same case as even with uh, schools that have a, a set schedule. You know, in elementary, elementary or high school, you know, you even in those cases, extreme cases where you have a set schedule, you don't have everyone coming at once. You have the teachers, you know, arriving earlier. Then you have the students arriving. You have you know drop offs leaving in the afternoon. There's after school activities. Uh, it's, it's it's pretty rare that you have everybody occupying a site, you know, come in a very short period and then leave the end of right. the day. Uh, and unless it's something like a, you know, Pratt and Whitney that has shift changes, you know, or uh, some very, where you have huge spikes. But uh, in this case, I don't, I don't expect huge spikes in the morning and afternoon. Right. I guess I'll, of use. Just, I'll just say our staff is saying if we're going to go with the 215, the traffic impact analysis should be adjusted you know, to some degree from where it is now. And then I guess the second thing is, it sounds like there's a disagreement over 19 parking spaces, if I'm reading everything correctly, that the applicant wants you know, 19 more 
than the 215. And I know the town engineer has concerns on, on drainage and pavement mm -hmm. and state requirements. But I, I guess, you know, if the applicant really feels they need 19 more above the 215 right now, rather than having the potential to build it out in the future, you know, then I'm, then I'm more concerned about the traffic impact because that seems to be saying, you know, it could be higher than the 215 in terms of the real, the real impact, the real need. Yeah. I guess, yeah. Joe, Joe, if I could uh, just jump on your observation, which is a good one. I guess another way to look at this is uh, how sensitive is that analysis? I, I understand your point that it's a parabola, but parabolas can be wide or they can be narrow. If it's a narrow parabola, then Joe's right. Uh, it needs to be adjusted. Uh, what I've heard you say kind of qualitatively, well, it's a parabola and it'll all work out with the numbers. But for consistency, I think Joe has a good point. So maybe back to you as the engineer who did uh, mark the, the study, you know, how sensitive is it? I mean, how much leeway do you have? <clears throat> Before it becomes well, before it becomes a problem, before it becomes a traffic problem, is is the question? Yeah, I mean, if you look at our our traffic statement here, um, for instance, in the weekday afternoon peak hour, we have uh, with the medical office, you had 160 trips. So, if literally there were 215 people on the site. And they all came at once or left at once, then in that extreme case, you'd actually have 50 more trips. I wouldn't expect that because they, that's, again, that's not the nature of this use uh, where you have everyone coming and leaving in the peak hour. And, the, and we're also talking about the commuter peak hour here, you know, and we're, we're assuming that as a worst case, everybody comes in in the commuter peak hour, which is 7.30 to 8.30 and leaves in the commuter peak hour in the afternoon peak hour is roughly 4.30 to 5.30. I mean, these class times, they don't, they don't all overlap with the peak hours. I mean, some of these are like a nine to three type class operation. So I, let me just pick not, up on you're, what- you're, you're just not, you're not gonna see, you're not gonna see that, that spike. Um, and, and maybe maybe it's something that Porter and Chester could provide a, a, you know, a, a more detail on, on the class schedule that would give, give a level of comfort there, but. Um, it's, it's, it's not how these, these sites typically operate. I mean, they have evening classes, um, so you're going to have some people leaving in the afternoon and then maybe coming for the evening uh, in a different, you know, shift. So the, the trips are spread out a little bit more throughout the day. I think what Peter was saying, and thank you, Peter, for mm -hmm. saying it, is so instead of 129 peak hour in the morning, if there were really 50 more than that and it was at one 80, what does that do to our levels of service at all the exits and entrances on the Silestine Highway and on Mill Street? You know, what levels are they at now and what would that extra traffic do to those levels, levels of, you know, delay or safety? Yeah, I mean, in the morning, it's almost all entering trips. So you're, you know, the entering trips are, are much easier movement than, uh, than an exiting trip. They're, they're right turns in or Mill Street, right turns in from Silas Dean or, or a left turn in from the left turn lane. So um, you're, you're gonna have uh, the entering trips, if it were if it were more, would not have a, an impact in the morning peak hour. And I think, in, as I mentioned in the afternoon, um, you know, you, there's like 45 to 50, but we're, we're talking a scenario here that I'm you know, extremely confident that's not going to be the case. You are not going to have every occupant of this site arriving and departing in, in the one peak hour of the morning or afternoon. That's, that's just not how this, this site will operate. You know, the, tra the traffic and the parking calculations, as I said, are, you know, they're, they're totally different calculations in the ITE manuals. Um, different equations, different data set, um, they are completely unrelated. The parking demand and traffic demand are, are, are unrelated. Yeah, 
well, and again, I guess I'm, I'm right. looking for comfort and I guess I just get back yeah. to the applicant saying we need, you know, 500 and yeah. whatever spaces. I mean, that's, that's the reality that I'm trying to make sure you're accounting for. Is, is our town engineer on this call? Is what? Uh, Derek is on the call, yes. Yes, I'm here. D Derek, what, what is your opinion on this? On this question of, of how, how sharp is this parabola here, is, is the question. Well, I would say I think it's, I think the information we've been given is, is a little confusing to date. Um, you know, the applicant has stated that this site operates as eight to three, classes are from eight to three and everyone's gonna be on site during that time. Um, however, you know, listening to the traffic engineer, he's saying, well, it's unlikely that's gonna happen, which is what, what our assumption was as well. Uh, so, you know, for, for us, we just feel like we haven't really gotten a lot of good information regarding the traffic other than that one letter. Um, as far as what was provided by the traf traffic engineer, it was just trip generation data based on the ITE manual, which is the resource for this type of information. So, you know, lacking him providing information on parking and his professional assessment, I, I appreciate the questions that are asked. Those are the same questions that we're asking um, about, you know, if, if you're going to say everybody's showing up at the same time, then the traffic report and the trip generation should reflect that data. And, and it doesn't, there's definitely a, a disconnect between the two and they're not coordinated. So, you know, I would say at this point, I don't, I just don't feel they've provided enough information to, to justify needing more than one to one ratio uh, for parking on the site. And they're looking for more than one space per employee and student. Uh, you know, just to step back, I mean, the reason why we're, we're really, we're concerned about this is that this site is a very large site. It's along Golf Brook. It's all located in the floodplain or majority of the site is. Um, this development is going to result in an increase of about three acres of impervious area on the site. And the town is under a DE permit, MS4 permit, uh, which requires us to be able to um, limit impervious area, we're actually supposed to be reducing impervious area every year, not just managing the increase, but actually reducing it. And with that, <clears throat> that is built into our regulations as well, that we just have to make sure whatever we're doing, we're doing it in a responsible manner and trying to reduce it as much as possible. So with that is why we brought up the parking with this. This is a new application. It's a much smaller building. It's a different use. It's got different generation requirements it got different traffic requirements so that's why we're looking at it now in, in the absence of having this data in the planning and zoning regulations as far as what the requirements are um, we're looking for you know more professional information as to what we should be utilizing in the absence of that staff has spent a considerable amount of time doing our own research um, to come up with this information so we can make an assessment that we feel comfortable with the commission you know as far as me, I have a job to do here, and, and, and I'm the one responsible for the permit. I'm the one who has to submit annual reports every year and sign and certify them. So, I mean, a, you know, an application like this will show up as a, a large increase in impervious. I need to be able to justify it and feel though as though it may, if it's justified, then it's justified. But if I don't feel like the data has been given and presented in a way that's coherent and makes sense, to me, I'm hearing a lot of different information even just today as to what's being expected. So I'd be looking for a little bit, I'd look for more information from the professional traffic engineer who would give us no information as far as what parking requirements are. If the Porter and Chester letter is the, the best and most reasonable uh, information to work off of, then they should be providing us with that information based on what they think that's gonna require for parking generation and what it's gonna require for trips. And we haven't received that. All right, Mike. With, with all due respect to the town employee uh, and Derek's comments, uh, I, I go to page two of the uh, memo that we received today at four o'clock. Uh, and in the second page, there's a table that he puts in there. And, and speaking of, you know, numbers and facts and getting back to my, uh, you know, my speech earlier where I said, I wanted to kind of clear the air a little bit and talk about just actual spaces because when you look at his 
his, uh, and again, with all due respect, on page two, he, when he talked about the ITE manual, he has 23 to 86 parking spaces based on a population of 175 students. On the next line, he says it increases uh, for 40 employees from 78 to 133. To me, that's what's making it confusing because we're talking about different numbers, not numbers that we've provided. It's actually numbers that the town has provided. And if you read through his comments, which we did read today at four o'clock when they were submitted to us uh, prior to this meeting, uh, there's all kinds of numbers in here. It goes on to say that based on a 25,000 square foot building, you should need 66 to 137 spaces. To me, as a person with no letters at the end of my name, a simple layman who owns property and is building a $15 million complex in Wethersfield, uh, reading those three bullet point lines in his is confusing, which is why I laid out my plan that a gentleman on the commission tonight said he understood and agreed and understood where we were coming from with the need of exact, you know, of exact parking spaces. The information that he put in here uh, you know, has already constructed spaces and is now going to do 58 space. That's what's really confusing. Let's just talk about actual spaces. Why are we confusing with all this other mumbo jumbo? I've also brought and paid for my traffic engineer who was here two years ago to describe what we needed. And it sounds like the town is going to just dis, dis, not even listen to what he's saying when, when somebody that's a professional says this is what it is. Well, that's what it is. That's that's when they come and how they come. And if the if the information seems disjointed, it's because the developer of real estate for Porter and Chester is not a traffic engineer or a parking engineer. And he writes a letter based on his level of comfort that he's providing the information uh, that's available. And when we get comments today at four o'clock, it's impossible for me three days before Christmas to get him on the phone or and get another letter that re-clarifies what he's already clarified to, I think, a reasonable degree of certainty of how many students they're going to have. And I really, I, I really strongly disagree with, with the comments that were just made. I really do. And I think we presented very clearly to this commission, like we did two years ago, the need uh, uh, for this. If the trip generation of how many trips in and out of the space are tonight a question, first I'm hearing about it because I've had several meetings with the town, several emails with the town, and chip generation has never come up during any of those conversations. It's always been number of parking spaces, which is why I focused my presentation on number of parking spaces and making it kindergarten proof on how you see the numbers on paper as to our need. Thank you. So if I may. Dom, you had, just if I may. Yeah, Dom, you had your hand raised. Yes, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for allowing me to speak too. And I, I, I have a feeling uh, what uh, the town engineer was going to respond to to what Mike just said. Um, one of the reasons why that memo I know for a fact went out so late was that uh, Mike uh, at a meeting yesterday uh, with myself and Denise. Um, we discussed uh, this situation and Mike was going to uh, supply us with his professional's uh, opinion. And so we held off on the letters, uh, uh, on the memo, to uh, uh, see that professional opinion, which we never uh, did. So that's one of the reasons, that's the reason for it, the lateness in that memo. Um, but again, I must thank the commission for allowing me to speak and... Uh, I did review the plan, as as the chairman had mentioned, and uh, I I might add that the plan was an excellent plan, as I relate to Mike yesterday. Um, it's a well done plan, um, especially from a planner's view uh, with the architecture and everything. It, it, it just was, as I said, an excellent plan and well done. And uh, except for one aspect, uh, it 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 you know, I, um, it totally meets the land use requirements of the town. So, um, and I might add, by the way, uh, that the site work that has been done has been, is uh, completed in an excellent manner also. So, I, I mean, just coming to town and, and seeing it, 
um, what your developers and especially Mike uh, has done is, is, is refreshing to be quite honest. Uh, but getting back to the issue at hand and uh, the town engineer has, I, I think, really uh, hit the point, uh, nail on the head when um, we say that the issue is, is parking in a way, but the main issue is the pervious uh, area versus imperious a area. And that's what the, this is, all, uh, we can't lose sight of the goal. And the goal is stated in the MS4 application as well as in our regulations. And what I'd like to do, if it's okay with the chairman and, and the commission, is just, uh, just go to the regulations to, to really focus in on um, why we're talking about parking. If I may, Mr. Chairman, it's just two sections and they're very short. Sure. Um, section two of the zoning regulations is, is the parking section. And section 2A, uh, the purpose of the parking regulations, and it says the purpose of these uh, regulations are to allow the minimum amount of parking and impervious areas. That's the very purpose of the, of, of the parking regulations and you say it up front. Uh, section 2C say, says for unique uses not explicitly uh, listed, which is the case here, um, you, you must do two things. Number one is you must meet with the staff to uh, uh, you know to try to work out an agreement on uh, a, a, a proper parking requirement, and um, and if no agreement is had, um, then the commission shall determine the parking requirement, and that um, and there's direction given to the commission right in the regulation which again is refreshing to see after all the regulations I have seen in the past 40 years. Um, A, it, these are the, uh, the direction that you're given. A, you, you look at the regulations itself and see if there's anything that is similar um, to the uses uh, that is being proposed. And or B, um, you may not have something similar. And then it's, to again, to quote, it says, referring to available parking requirement information from other professionals and reference source, as reference source. So that's um, getting back to what Derek was saying. We were, um, we started off with the professional uh, engineers, um, traffic study, traffic generation study, and it, it is his traffic generation study, and I, and I refer to Mike too. Mike, uh, you might look that through too if you have a problem with the 36 dash whatever, um, that's, that's in there too. That's where we got that. But anyway, um, the traffic generation study um, uses, as, as uses, uh, the most closely related uh, use as a community college. So what we did is when we were looking through this, we used the same, we figured we should use the same as what the applicant is using. Um, and so that's, that's where our numbers came from. We were thinking that 137 spaces, which was the highest number given for the, if, in that report. And so that's where we were working for, from, but um, it is confusing. It's totally confusing, Mike, um, if I may address you personally here. Um, I, it's, you know, I, I laugh, but I, I told uh, Denise and, 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 and Derek uh, the other day that I'm putting up light bulbs, uh, uh, Christmas bulbs on our tree and all I can think of is some of the numbers, you know, 215, 610. And I'm saying, what the heck am I doing here uh, do, doing this? But it is confusing, but it, 
in if you're just looking at the numbers. Again, um, 215. Um, I the only regulation that I've known uh, as that I can recall that has a one to one um, uh, parking ratio, one space per population per person um, is, you know, if you have a zero bedroom uh, residential unit, um, that, you know, that would be a one to one. Any other use, I, I don't know if any other, not saying there's none, but if you think about it, there's a reason why. Oh, you know, one to one use means that it it'll be totally occupied for the entire time that that there is a use and it'll be totally not only will it be 100 percent capacity but it'll be totally occupied by people who are uh, a who have an automobile and that's you know the, uh, that's not realistic um so the again we're not trying to <laughs> and to quote mike uh, you know we're not trying here to to uh, knock off parking just to do that. And we're not used to looking at things that way because most people are trying to reduce the parking. But in this case, it's, it's a, it, the site is totally in a floodplain and we are committed to, to reduce per, uh, impervious material where we can. And that's, what the, and that's where, we're, where we're coming from. The other, as I said before, the, the site plan, I don't have any other comments other than a little path through, <laughs> through a, a, an area that I spoke to Mike and we worked that out yesterday. So, that, so from that standpoint, other than the, this parking and impervious material, there are no further uh, planning comments uh, uh, unless Denise has some that I, uh, I'm not aware of at this time. But, um, and we, if we, had the information from the traffic engineer, like I, I thought we were getting this morning, um, we would have very well not even be having this discussion. Because, um, because I did hear, and correct me if I'm wrong, traffic engineer, um, I did hear you say that, that it was your professional opinion that this is a, this is a proper parking requirement. Um, so, you know, with that, um, sort of, if that's a certification, then, then I'd like to discuss that further with him and as Derek would. And again, I thank the commission. All right, thank you. Yes, I, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I, I did verbally pre present um, what would have been drafted uh, in a letter and I certainly can provide that letter, but um, what I verbally you didn't present- provide that letter? I can provide a letter, yes. Um, but the um, what is being presented there is that we do not have, a, you know, a synonymous use in our industry industry standard documentation that accounts for a workforce training center. And based on my review of the data in the ITE parking generation manual, the junior community college rates are, you know, they're all over the place. Um, they're too low in certain calculations, too high in others. So that is not yielding an accurate representation or estimate of what should be provided on this site either. Uh, so my professional opinion is that we need to uh, determine this parking based on the operational data of the end user of Porter and Chester. They know their operation. They provided their letter and the maximum number of people on that site. That is by far the best information we have to go by. Uh, we don't have the luxury of being able to count other Porter Chesters in this area. As I mentioned, I, I looked at every one in the state and they're all in mixed use developments. So I, can't, I can't get a good count of what the, the parking occupancy is in those other uh, developments. So there's no better information to go by based on the information they're, they're telling us what their operations are. So, so, so you, you would suggest that the 215 is the proper information not the extra 19. My opinion, correct, is 175 students plus 40 faculty is the max on the site. So you would need to need to provide 215 spaces uh, to accommodate that. Thank you. Mike. 
it sounds like we're now going to zero in on the 19 extra spaces. And again, I, I go back for this commission's, and I know this is going longer than most of you thought it would. And I apologize, I apologize and appreciate you hanging in there with us. I think it's going to look now, we're going to be starting to look at the 19 spaces and what can I do with the 19 spaces. But I remind you, in the calculations that I presented, not accounted for is any visitors, any non-use of handicapped parking that there's 40 on the site. Um, I did hear uh, at a town meeting a week ago that maybe we should restripe them. Uh, I'm not an advocate of reducing handicapped parking uh, to any level, especially when you have a large medical building. Uh, I don't think that that's a wise choice anywhere on the site. And I think the 19 spaces that we're asking for over and above the 215 that my traffic engineer said would be sufficient for the site. I think I've proven in multiple different ways how those spaces could be used every day. And if, if with all due respect, if the town is going to start to think about either eliminating those 19 spaces or turning those 19 spaces into some kind of pervious pavers or something of that sort of anything other than blacktop, I think the, the idea is, is that I've proven that those 19 spaces are not gonna be extra like never used. They're gonna be used quite often because they're, we're gonna have visitors. There's gonna be students that show up to sign up for class or pay their bill, or there's gonna be people who leave their car overnight when they go to the hospital or the handicap. There's multiple, not one, multiple different reasons why those 19 spaces can be used. And if they're done with impervious pavement, the first person that gets out of their car with high heeled shoes and sticks their foot in the ground and twists and breaks an ankle, is going to send my insurance rates through the roof and cause me a thirty to fifty thousand dollar lawsuit, and that's not something that I'm interested in uh, in, in entertaining. It just it's not. I'm, I'm not asking for 19 extra spaces on a parking lot that has 19 spaces. I'm asking for 19 spaces on 554 spaces that I can account for and show that those 19 can and will probably be used very often. And I think I've made the presentation and my numbers very clear uh, and not all over the place. And I think one commissioner realized that tonight when he spoke that he understood and he appreciated it. So again, I, I understand where the town is coming from. I understand it's confusing. I brought my traffic engineer who unfortunately at a last minute notice couldn't get a letter written this morning, but he did provide me a letter this afternoon, very, very, very late in the afternoon that we would, I'd be happy to share but I thought better than even a letter would be to have him here to discuss what's in that letter along with everything else he's just discussed tonight. And I just don't think without a shadow of a doubt we've shown uh, you know, on this project that we're not, you know, we're not being greedy. We're not, and, and listen, I understand the need for green space. We're not using the, uh, the playground area is all grass. As we speak, it's grass ready to be mowed. Um, I did eliminate six spaces where I wanted to have six spaces close to the building for potential you know, faculty parking so that they get a little more premium parking. I eliminated those uh, since the Inland Wetlands meeting to gain another thousand square feet of green space. I tried at the Inland Wetlands to get impervious pavers behind the building where we don't necessarily need to drive in front of those grates that Charlie showed, except that the fire marshal says no, his apparatus won't fit and he can't get the struts out that stabilize his equipment. So the regulations say we have to try and, and, and do it. And I think we did, and I think we have. And I think with all the things I mentioned that we did the first go around two years ago by eliminating parking spaces then, don't forget not to confuse you, this original, original plan asked for 648 spaces. We got approved for 610 and we're reducing again from 610 to 540 tonight. We are reducing. Um, and it's it, it with all of this confusion and the numbers in these, uh, uh, comments from the town, it is confusing. It was confusing for Inland Wetlands who wasn't prepared to talk about parking, which is why we're talking about it tonight. And I think simplifying it tonight in the way that I did makes it simple. It doesn't make it confusing. And, and I stand by what I said, and I'm willing uh, to, to, to leave it on the table as is, because I think we've proven without a reasonable doubt with traffic engineers, with architects, with engineers, with myself, with me owning the building at 1260, where everyone on the Zoom call knows that people drive around in circles every day looking for parking. And I don't wanna have that again. And the town doesn't wanna have that again. And my tenant who is in the building at 1260 doesn't wanna have it at 1210. I, I, you know, I, I just don't understand 
why we're mincing words for 19 spots when it now looks that it appears that 215 are 100% proven by what the traffic engineer just said in response uh, to the planning department. I just don't, I don't see it. And I've invested, and, and I, listen, you guys all know, I do the right thing. I own five buildings in Weathersfield. I've been in town for 15 years. We put our best foot forward at all times. We put our best foot forward in this project for two and a half years. I spent $15, $15 million out of my pocket to make this work. I'm bringing back a great asset from the town of Rocky Hill back to the town of Weathersfield. There's going to be 175 students and 320 people in the medical that are going to go buy coffee at Starbucks. They're going to go across the street to Staples and buy paper. They're going to travel around to all the restaurants in town. We we'll have a $5 million fit up for building number one that's going to generate taxes. I just don't see how 19 parking spots are this much of an issue on a property that I'm spending over $15 million on. I understand the trip generator, the ITE, the regulations, but we have done everything tonight to show you that this is viable, needed, and reasonable. Thank you. May I add something? This is Charlie Nyberg. Uh, yep. The original building as has been represented was 40, as is 40,000 square feet. Starling originally was going to be taking 30, about five to six of that was going to be for the daycare center. As the project evolved, the, as I mentioned, the uh, daycare center was eliminated. We have radiology. We have, a, we have five uh, internal medicine spaces. We have radiology. We have OBGYN. We have a blood draw. We have ophthalmology. And um, I think there's a couple of others. Uh, and Mike's table, I think he used uh, all of the uh, various uh, people, uh, practices that are gonna be in the building along with Starling's uh, doc numbers and nurses and MAs and what have you. The one thing that hasn't been accounted for is that one of the tenants that we had designed a space for dropped out. We now have that space as a major conference room for Starling to use periodically for upwards of 120 people. They have to be accommodated on site. So in fact, we do need that extra 19 spaces. Okay. Just so that we can kind of focus things. Is there anything other than the 19 parking spaces that is a, an, an open issue before us tonight. Um, I know that, that Joe had asked questions about, um, you know, the, the timing of the trips and Peter talked about the shape of the parabola and so forth. I don't know whether that information has been provided or whether you're satisfied with that or whether we're, we're in a position to just move on um, from that. Um, you know, trying to trying to kind of narrow the focus here of all of this discussion to you know what it, what it is that's still outstanding difference between you know town staff and the applicant. Um, we've certainly heard the explanations on both sides, but I want to make sure that you know we've got all of the issues on the table. Mr. Chairman, if I could just kind of summarize where I'm kind of falling on this, maybe it will help. I think the 19 spaces is on us. We're just going to have to decide. Uh, and this commission will have to deliberate and vote on that. Uh, as yep. far as the trips in and out, uh, I, I think we could probably use a little bit more refined information from the uh, engineer that did the work and, and, and maybe a discussion between him and town staff would be warranted. It's just my opinion, you know, it, it, they can speak if, if I'm out of line here, but it just seems to me that it came late, uh, the numbers are confusing. Uh, uh, I, I'm sure it could be worked out if these two gentlemen uh, had better dialogue over that. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and I, I'm thinking that even if it can't be worked out, at least we know what the issue is. And it, it 
it also strikes me that maybe more specific data from Porter and Chester would put you and Joe at ease as far as, you know, it's not going to be a parade of 215 cars pulling in at 830 and pulling out at 430. Yes, I agree with that. I think that yeah, that that's key to get that information. And if the information is is more of a spike than I had originally anticipated, I'm also happy to rerun the trip numbers and you know run a capacity analysis to drive if we have to. Um, but I, I'm I'm confident that um, you know, there would not be an impact over what was previously approved. Hey, hey Rich, this yeah, is David I mean, Drake. Can I say something? Yeah, Dave. Sure. Uh, again. I'll be honest with you, I'm kind of shaking my head here a little bit back and forth. There's 550 spaces in this spot and we're arguing over 3% and traffic studies, I mean, it's a science, but it ain't, it's not within 3%. I just, I just can't believe we're gonna sit here and possibly walk away from a project like this over 3%. That doesn't even remotely make any sense to me. This is insane to me. <laughs> this is a great project over 20 parking spaces. This is like, this is, come on guys. This is like stupid. <laughs> if it was 150 spaces, I sit there and say, yeah, okay. We could maybe think this too, but this is really 20 spaces, even 50 spaces. This yeah. is, you know, traffic studies is just, again, it, it's probably as inexact a size as you could probably have. So I mean, I just, uh, David, I just, I don't know. I'm an engineer. I, I'll tell you. 3% doesn't mean anything to me in this type of thing. Doesn't mean anything. You don't David, know anything. Just, Monday through Friday, 3% means nothing. Doesn't I would mean just well, say, you're not a nuclear engineer like Peter is. Well, <laughs> right, but Peter's got to be within 3%. So I'll give Peter the 3%. But I'm just saying, I look at this project, I'm saying we're arguing, this is a great project. It seems like a great spot. If we're worried about uh, impervious, puts a, put a, piece of the parking it's lot and make it gravel in the back or something. Yeah. But again, 20 spaces doesn't make any sense to me to fight over. It's just it's, it's insane to me. Uh, on 550. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I appreciate your input. I mean, I, I just kind of wanted to make sure that we we had our arms around what the what the issue was. Um, Chris, you have your hand up and then Dom. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Chris is a video coach, Jensen Miller. Uh, not to say this will help clarify the matter at all, but I do want to point out that all of the uh, paved spaces on this site do go to water quality structures, will be treated prior to any discharge to Gulf Brook, which is something Kevin said at the beginning of his presentation. However, that was a long time ago, and I think that might be forgotten at this point. Uh, so it's not as though this site didn't meet some of the guidelines of the MS4. The previous site, the old Puritan furniture did not treat any water running off of it. Uh, it was built in the late 50s, so it didn't meet any of these guidelines. Uh, we are meeting those guidelines today, uh, at least in terms of treating the water. So maybe we don't get the reduction in impervious surface that uh, Mr. Greg is looking for, but we are treating the runoff. Thank you. Okay. Tom, you had your hand up. The only, the only thing I wanted to say, Mr. Chairman, to that, to that matter about the 3%, it represents uh, 60 around anywhere between 6,000 and 7,000 square feet of pervious material. So uh, it, it's not the number. Again, getting back to the goal, the goal is to you know to reduce the pervious material. So just to uh, um, put that in perspective. Thank you, Chair, Mr. Chair. Okay. Thank you. Um, I guess before we lose track of the fact that this is a public hearing, um, I would ask if there are any members of the public who want to comment on this application. There was one piece of correspondence that came in on Friday from looks like about 10 residents on Middletown Avenue. Um, having concerns about the change in use they weren't happy with what there was before but now that um, they're talking about evening classes they can anticipate the sounds of car doors slamming and car engines running and revving up and students walking around talking to each other um, and also commenting that the trees along the, the railroad that had shielded them from the 
you know, the development over by the Silasbean have all been removed so that, uh, you know, they see this as um, further disruption through the, through the evening classes and that they're opposed to the plan. Um, Kelly? Or not? I'm sorry, can, can everyone hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Kelly Urso and I reside at 425 Middletown Avenue. Um, and I would like to speak on regarding this uh, proposal. Um, I have a concern with how our backyards have been opened up to the buildings and to the parking lot. Um, we've been completely exposed to the Silas theme. Um, prior to this development, we had a buffer with trees that were there. I never saw the highway. Um, that's all changed. Um, now with this change in proposal, we're gonna be subjected to nighttime traffic with the school. We're gonna have headlights shining at our houses with cars pulling in and out, students hanging in the parking lot, talking, et cetera. Um, I understand there's also a mechanics program, which will create additional noise with a garage, um, a garage of which is facing my backyard. Um, I'm sure the proposal will pass. Um, however, with some other past projects within the town, um, <clears throat> one of which was at the other, other end of Middletown Avenue, um, there was no consideration to the residents um, with that pass as well. Um, it's not that I'm against development for the town and increased revenue. However, um, <clears throat> with, um, well, my taxes, be adjusted when the value of my home decreases um, from this development in my backyard. Um, I don't think it's unreasonable to ask if a fence can be installed high enough to block the, um, the traffic that our neighborhood has now been exposed to. Um, <clears throat> I feel the town and the owner um, should consider this um, for the residents of Middletown Avenue as our privacy, security, and home values have been compromised. Um, I ask that you please put yourself in our shoes. Um, if this was your backyard, um, if this is completely changed for us here. I mean, I'm listening tonight about, you know, everyone going back and forth about the increased parking that's needed, which, is, you know, speaks about the sheer amount of value we're gonna have in our backyard. Um, somebody on the commission mentioned about structures on the roof. That's important weather skills sensitive to, oh, we can't have that view. Um, what about our views on Middletown Avenue? What about what we have sacrificed? You know, everyone here, you know, is talking about it's just a great project. This is good for the town. What about what's good for the residential area on Middletown Avenue? Not one person tonight has mentioned about what we have sacrificed as homeowners. Um, so I, I just I just want everybody to take that into consideration. I want, you know, I go out, I no longer feel comfortable in my backyard. My neighborhood has completely changed with this project. And I understand Puritan, it was an eyesore. Um, I understand, you know, the new buildings now, um, it's an improvement for the town, but you have to consider the residents that are behind. I pretty much now live on the Silas Bean Highway. I didn't have that years ago when I bought this property. So everything has changed for us. So again, I just want you to, you know, consider our views as, as residents back here. Um, consider putting up a fence, giving, giving us something since we've had to sacrifice so much for this development. Um, you have all so much to gain, but as a neighborhood, we've, we've lost in this project. So um, thank you for letting me speak. Thank you. Um, John Mills. Uh, good evening. Uh, for the record, John Mills, licensed professional engineer, um, a senior project manager in the engineering department, and I serve as the town's wetlands agent. Um, I just wanted to speak uh, uh, based off of uh, the memo that was released today. Um, from Mr. Gregor, the town engineer, in support of phase two of this development and the parking needs um, due to the fact that 
uh, the Wetlands Commission uh, approved this application, um, but it was conditional that uh, the number of additional parking spaces allowed uh, be reduced uh, to the maximum extent practicable as determined by uh, your commission. Um, from the phase one medical building, which was previously constructed, um, the memo that was released uh, speaks to uh, the fact that um, uh, there may be an overbuilt parking situation uh, that exists and the high ratio uh, of approximately uh, nine uh, spaces per square foot of building um, is uh, in excess of what the ITE manual uh, states uh, using the uh, trip generation model that was previously provided. Um, so in harmony with what had been previously discussed and mentioned by some of the commissioners, I uh, just want to bring the commission's attention, uh, Chairman, to the um, uh, fifth point of uh, the comment that uh, parking spaces uh, could be relocated or removed or replaced with pervious lawn or landscaped areas, um, allowing the construction of new parking areas near the building without increasing impervious area at the site, uh, just due to the fact that uh, with the MS4 permit uh, come the end of the year uh, with this um, expansive uh, impervious area constructed, um, that would be a consideration uh, from engineering staff that would have to justify, you know, uh, why so much uh, parking was provided more um, than what the uh, ITE manual states was needed. Thank you. And I guess just to, to close the loop on that point, you don't believe that the applicant has provided sufficient justification for the additional spaces? Um, in my opinion, and uh, in harmony with this memo that was jointly issued uh, from both uh, the planning staff uh, and the engineering staff, uh, I'm confident that uh, should uh, this commission um, make that determination on what uh, uh, the allowable parking would be, uh, that uh, town staff could work it out with uh, Mr. Rucci and with the applicant. Um, however, noting that uh, the previously constructed 40,000 square foot phase one medical building um, and the reduction from a 40,000 square foot medical use to a smaller 25,000 square foot, um, it just notes that uh, the high ratio, higher than a one-to-one -one ratio of uh, a parking to student employee uh, that exists is, uh, as was noted, in the memo, uh, uh, it, it would be higher uh, than would be for a medical facility. So I'm confident that uh, uh, with the traffic engineer and with town staff, uh, this could be worked out. We just, um, from the Wetlands Commission, we, we are looking for a determination on uh, what this commission wishes to do for uh, that parking, which affects impervious. Okay, thanks. Susan Woodward. It's actually Bob Woodward, the email's in my wife's name. I live at 456 <laughs> Middletown Avenue. I do not back on to the property. I can see the, the medical building going up from my front porch and I have no complaints about what you're building. But I did some reconnoitering after listening to people on the other side of the street in our neighborhood. It's a long street, but we've learned to hang together as a neighborhood when we were rolled over by the by the proposal up at the other end of the street. And I went around and looked at the property that you have and noted some good things, but also noted indeed a lot of trees that were there are down and then the houses on from about 403 to 433 can indeed get a pretty good view of Silas Dean that they never could before. And I think people from the neighborhood took some time to write some letters and I, I think some consideration could be given to the people on the other side of the street who have some feelings to share. Uh, I don't think we're trying to stop the project so much as we're just trying to say, hey, we are here as a neighborhood 
and uh, we we deserve to be listened to. Thank you. Thanks. I know that wasn't the the principal objective of tonight's discussion, but I do know that we talked about it a couple of years ago, and it was before COVID, so my memory is pretty well gone as far as what it was. But my recollection is that a lot of those trees belong to the railroad and they were the ones that took them down and that there were limitations on the heights of things that could be, you know, installed to screen those residents from, from your project. I don't know, either Kevin or Mike, do you remember that? Yeah, I can, I can yeah. definitely speak on, on a couple different levels. Uh, one is two years ago, several re residents, including, I believe, Mr. Woodward and, and possibly, uh, I don't see her last name, Kelly, and several others uh, showed up at the night of the public hearing. And I recall it vividly turning around and putting my back to you as commissioners and directly speaking to them, saying that one of the things that I am in Weathersfield is a person that is a man of his word and very, very cognizant of projects that we build or remodel or add on to to the people that are around us, especially when it's residential. And I assured all, I think there was eight or 10 residents that showed up at that meeting. And I assured all of them, I see Mr. Woodward shaking his head, all of them understood that I wasn't a blind eye to what was going on. I realized, uh, yes, we took down a dilapidated building and we put up a nice building. So that's a, a, a fair swap. I realize also that on that 12 acre site, there were trees and there was a wood component to that. And we did take that down to put the, 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 the project up. But I will say with all due respect to the neighbors that I still am appreciative of what you're bringing to the table tonight. But I will let you know that we uh, have um, uh, lowered the overall landscape on the property, the overall level of where you stand down several feet, uh, maybe seven or eight feet of digging to get the proper things we needed for flood storage and drainage and stuff like that. And Kevin, are you still able to screen share? I am. Okay, I, I would love you to screen share a couple of pictures that I took today at 4.30. Do you see those? Uh, let me just move the people over here. Okay, so this is now the parking lot that we've all been talking about. Uh, Chairman, to your, uh, to your uh, uh, correctness, you'll see the power lines that run up along the side, along the back end of the property. You'll also see um, what you can't see. What you can't see there is that at the top of the slope, which is apparently, I'd say roughly 10 to 15 feet, and then including the cattails that you see that were not taken down, are the railroad tracks that are way higher. And if you look in this particular picture, you'll see the tree lines that are in all of those residents' backyards that don't look too good in December, but uh, that, that I can't change, obviously. But when they're all in bloom, you're still looking at the trees that you have. And Kevin, if you can go to the next photo, which shows a different angle. Sorry. If you look here, again, underneath the power lines, we were limited to what we can do. We put all the cattails in and standing in the parking lot and taking the photo, and I'd be taller than any headlights. And because we've lowered the property so much, you don't even see the, you don't even see it. And I didn't mean to laugh because that's not the right thing to do, but with all due respect to the neighbors, I don't even see your rooftops barely in these pictures. Um, I think we have a couple more, a couple different angles. Uh, here's a straight on shot. The two, and way at the left, you can see the, a two-story house that's there. And uh, I'm not sure which of the people that, that uh, and here's the other one. There's, these are, you're looking at all the gutter lines of all these houses. So uh, I respectfully, I wanna be, I wanna be uh, compassionate to the neighbors. I did say that we were gonna do the best we can. We did, we were uh, restricted underneath the power lines as to the height that we can put anything back there. And to be quite honest, if I put a fence where I would maybe be able to, at the at the curb line, the cattails are going to be higher than the fence. Uh, I, I would I would be more than willing to meet again with the neighbors like I was two years ago, 
to see if there's things I could plant in their backyard on their property. I'd be happy to do that. It's not within the, the realm of things that I haven't done on every other project that we've built to make sure that the neighbors are comfortable. But I did the best that I could and looking at what you actually see from my parking lot. And again, with all due respect, I don't see how kids speaking or talking in our parking lot, you're gonna hear that in your house from that distance. And certainly any headlights are gonna die into that hill and that slope uh, that borders my property and the residential area. So I I'm not sure that traffic uh, headlights are gonna beam into people's kitchens or while they're watching TV uh, at seven o'clock at night or now when it gets dark at 4.30, like this picture was taken. Even at 4.30, I don't think headlights are, I don't think that that's, that's that, but I'd be happy, Mr. Woodward and uh, for uh, Kelly, I think was the name that spoke. I'd be happy to meet with anybody on, on that street, which I was two years ago uh, to see if we can remedy something on your property that helps because on my property, the height of the railroad tracks and what I'm capable of doing underneath the power lines, I've done to the extent that I can. And, and the residents knew two years ago and the commission heard me, I, I'm very sympathetic to the neighborhood and don't intend to come in and steamroll anybody, whether it's the town, the neighbors, or you know the neighboring buildings that I have to the left and right of me, that's just not our intention. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Kelly and then Mr. Woodward. You're mute. Okay, can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, Thank you, Mike. Um, I appreciate the feedback. Um, and I understand where you're coming from, from that angle. But I think like, as Bob pointed out earlier, you have to come to this side of the house. <laughs> when I look out my bedroom window, literally like all your, your, your trucks, you know, your, that where the phase two building is going to be built. It's just an eye shot right there. I mean, if cars are pulling in over there, it's definitely going to be hitting in the back of our house. So I think you really need to come from this angle and look this way over. Uh, I understand what you mean by the grade. It is graded lower, but we still are going to see cars pulling in and out. When I go to my neighbor next door where you, I think it was the Brown Cape 433, she has a deck. When you're on her deck, she's just got a straight shot of the parking lot out there, and she has a pool. So, uh, you know, it, it, is, it, it has, our view has been exposed. Okay, so, I, I, thank, you. I, you're, I, thank you. And I'm, uh, I'm glad that in your speech, I heard you say that you were not against the project for the merits of the project. I would be more than happy to meet with Mr. Woodward, yourself or the other signatures on the letter to see if there's anything I can do on your side of the railroad tracks to help. But you have to understand that I am limited on my side as to what I can physically uh, do. I just, I, 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 I'm in handcuffs on that side and I just, I can't, but I'm, I'm happy to meet with you one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, I'm an open book. My number is listed on the website and I, I answer my cell phone all the time. Please call me and I'm, I'm happy to discuss it. And uh, again, I was happy for both of you to acknowledge that you're not against the plan, so to say, you're just against that and you'd be willing to listen to me outside of this meeting and on things that I can do to help all of your neighbors, not just the two of you that stuck it out here for a couple of hours, which I also appreciate. Thank you. Right, and, and yeah, Christine was the one that wrote the letter. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I, just, I just wanna add, I did drive in the parking lot of the dental building and I got a good view and I could pick out Kelly's garage and house very easily. That was not, that was not covered with trees. I could pick out the back of the garage very, very easily. But I do remember the meeting, Mike, and you were very gracious. And while my house doesn't back on it, I, as I said, we've learned because of the project up at 24 Maple to stick together as a neighborhood. And, uh, you know, we've, we've, Christine and I talked some, and I think whatever you could do with, for, to talk with the neighbors on that side with between 403 and 433 would be appreciated, I'm sure. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I think for purposes of tonight, we'll we'll take everyone at, at their word that they're going to proceed in good faith. And if things fall apart, feel free to come back and talk to us about it. But we'll leave that where it is for now. 
Um, does anybody else on the commission have any any comments or questions? Um, you know, to to try to help sort of focus the discussion and lead us in a in some direction here. I mean, I guess, I guess, you know, hearing crickets, although crickets probably went to bed about four hours ago, um, it, you know, it, it seems like to me the, the two options are either we, we close the hearing and have a conversation and make a decision, or, you know, we, we table it for a couple of weeks so that, um, you know, they can get more information from Porter and Chester and, and maybe provide either documentation or, or something that can reassure the commission on the trips. Um, you know, the, the two engineers can kind of take another run at each other as far as whether the, you know, the spaces are truly necessary or not and whether there's any wiggle room there. Um, you know, and I, at this point, I'm, I'm kind of ambivalent and just want to, um, you know, do whatever the, the rest of the commission thinks is more appropriate, or if there's a third option that I haven't identified, I'm, I'm all ears. Hey, Rich, it sounds like from the town guys that the town and the owner can, maybe they could sit down a couple of meetings, come to peace with the parking and the, uh, you know, the drainage situation. Maybe they can work that out, come back to us. Right now, for me, I'm positive on the project. We could just everybody be happy with the parking, but if they could resolve that to some happy spot, I'd be I'm good with it. And at the same time, I'd like to see the owner talk to the neighbors because I, you know, for a project this size, we should be able to make the neighbors a little happier in terms of doing something there. If you know, to, if those two issues can be helped out and come back real quick, I mean, I I'm very positive on the project, the way it, you know. Yes. Hang and on. again, it sounds like the town guys have come to peace with it, with something. This is Chairman. I'm going to echo what Dave just said. I, I also am positive on this project, but I, I, I do think there's still some open issues that maybe one more round of discussions between town staff and his engineer Correct. and yep. the neighbors. I, I really do feel the neighbors need a, a better hearing here. Uh, both neighbors tonight uh, really moved me in there imploring, you know, and it sounds like the applicant is willing. So maybe a discussion and hearing a positive outcome of that would, would just feel better all around. I mean, it, 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 it's still uh, an open item that maybe would help everybody on this commission. So I'm okay with tabling this, if that's what you're suggesting, Dave, you know, that, that's okay. I, 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 I'm just saying we could fight about this for a week, but I think the town guys can sit down with the owner and the engineers. They should come up, they could, like you say, you're positive, I'm positive, I think everybody in the committee is positive. Just, just come to peace with the parking thing where both people can resolve it. And I would, I would agree to whatever they agree to. And, and I'm going to go back to the neighbors. Can, can they put a fence up? Is that a showstopper? I don't, I, I don't know, but they should be able to help these guys out a little bit, you know, but. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, are you looking for a motion? Mm -hmm. so, table this. Rich? Um, well, I guess Mike has his hand up first. Oh, I'm okay. sorry. I, that's no problem. I, I just thought that I should speak before there was a motion and you closed the public hearing because you said earlier that that once it's closed, you, you can't speak. And I just want to speak just a quick second about tabling the project. Um, Inland Wetlands was able to uh, rustle up the meetings quick enough so that I can get before you before this meeting because this is a time critical thing for me. And again, as spoken by a couple of gentlemen, they're positive on the project. The project seems to meet. I understand that you want me to meet with the neighbors. I've been a man of my word for 15 years and Mr. Woodward and Ms. Kelly uh, will definitely be hearing with me from me along with the rest of the people on the street. I don't have any problem with that. I don't think the town, uh, I don't know that that's really part of an approval process here that I meet with the neighbors, but I will do it. Uh, there's no reason why I wouldn't. And I'm sure you'll hear from the neighborhood if I didn't. Uh, and, and tabling the matter uh, could really put the project in jeopardy. And I don't say that just lightly, it really could. And 
uh, I don't want to lose this tenant. If I lose this tenant, the next tenant could be a 40,000 square foot medical tenant where 610 parking spots that are already approved get built. And I think that this project is actually better than a two story building where we have 610 approved spaces that I could build tomorrow. And, uh, you know, so I understand why people are saying, but maybe can there be an approval with conditions that I meet with the tenant, you know, I meet with the, the neighbors and that, that I communicate with town staff, but I, I warned this commission that we have been working with the town uh, via emails, via Mr. Vertucci, Kevin Johnson. We, we've been doing that. We've had several on-site meetings and enough emails back and forth. And I'm not sure that I concur that the two of us are ever going to, that the town and I are going to see uh, you kind of eye to eye on, uh, on, on these 19 parking spaces. I, I, I thought we put our best foot forward today and meeting again tomorrow or next week or before next meeting. I don't know that there's going to be a different outcome because I'm very, very sincere in, in showing the, the parking spaces that I need. I don't see converting 19 of them to impervious, uh, like a commission member said. We're arguing over a, a really small thing, and I can appreciate the M4, but as uh, my other expert, Mr. Sabido, said we, we did do some of the M4 stuff. So maybe is there is there an avenue or a third option where we can approve with some conditions that I have one more go around with the town engineer and the town staff and we see if there's something. But I think I've shown and I, I really am willing to 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 uh, see this go before you as a vote because I think we've proven our point. I really do I think we did it two years ago. I think we did it again tonight. Um, I realize you see some gray areas. I'm happy to have Mr. Vertucci redo his traffic report as a condition to an approval. I'm happy to all of those things. Um, but uh, a delay and for me to have to come back at another meeting after the first of the year is uh, going to put me in serious jeopardy as I have to report to court mm -hmm. the findings of this commission. And, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm nervous about that. I'm really nervous that this project could die tonight. And if it does, that's not a threat. It's just, it, it's a real possibility. And I think that that would be a, a big strike for the town not to bring these people back to town and everything that they're gonna bring back to town. And I, I just hope that there could be some thought process there that maybe I could have some conditions, I'll meet the conditions and I can meet the conditions and still tell Porter and Chester that you know we can get the project moving forward. And I appreciate the last kind of word on the project. Thank you. Mr. Yeah, Chairman, I mean, Paul. Can I, Chairman, can I Paul? ask the applicant one other question on what he just said? Is that something I can do? Yep. Mike, uh, you know, it's going to be really difficult if, if you guys don't come to terms here. You know, we can't get in the middle of that. It'd be nice for us to be clear on how important are those 19 spaces to you? I mean, is, is it a showstopper? I mean, if we were to approve this tonight without the 19 spaces, what, what would happen? Uh, I think I would be in jeopardy of having people park on those 19 spaces that are either non-existent or impermeable paved spaces, which I would have to rip up because they're already constructed. Uh, I would be in jeopardy of, uh, and I would be fearful that those spaces are going to be used every day at the peak times, that some of those 19 will be used. And if they're impervious and a lady gets out or someone gets out with a high heel and trips, I'm going to get sued, and that's just not a liability I'm willing to take. And spaces that I'm very confident, my traffic engineer, the the, the information I brought tonight, I think clearly shows they're going to be used. I, I don't even know, like Mr. Drake said, I'm not even sure why. I'm baffled. I'm really baffled, and I and I apologize for being baffled, but it, it's a showstopper. It really is, and I and I don't say that lightly, and I, uh, I I'm pretty matter of fact about it. I don't want to lose this tenant. I don't want to lose the ability to bring them and this project to the town. Remember, nobody's speaking about the fact that a 40,000 square foot medical tenant would bring me far more revenue than a 25,000 square foot uh, quarter in Chester. But I feel that strongly to, to, to go that route and not wait for a 40,000 square foot tenant that I'm asking for 19 spaces. You know, I've been more than reasonable for, for two months on this and I'm willing to take my shot and let the board vote on this as is. 
with some conditions if you want to meet me with the neighbors and you want Mr. Vitucci to redo his stuff and submit it to the town engineer. Uh, I'm, I'm willing to take those conditions with a, a, with a positive reply tonight, but a, 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 a continuation for me is, it could be a death sword. It really could. And I, and I don't say that lightly. And I don't say that just because. Cool. Yeah, hey, thanks, um, Rich. I'm, I'm new and I'm an alternate, so I'm not quite sure what I say and what I ask about. But I, my, my comment here is I listened to this and, and Mr. Panic beat me to it. Listening to this, um, I'm bullish on the project. I think getting in Porter and Chester back in town would be a win, win for the town. It, my question was going to be, is there a way to put together a vote that allows him to move forward with speed with, with some stipulations? I think in a prior meeting I had sat in on, we had done something like that. So I think my comment is just given the, the economy's got some kind of funny looking cracks potentially in the future, I wouldn't want to see slowing this down end up, uh, you know, through, through, through the process jeopardizing getting that, you know, if there's any funding or anything that the school needs to move. I just wouldn't want to slow it down and derail it. Yeah, I mean, I, that, that's obviously a possibility. I mean, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm sorry that this has been a subject of discussion among the principals for two months or more, but, you know, we get the information, you know, at five o'clock today. So, you know, we're, don't don't have the same luxury of having perseverated over it the same way you did. I don't know, Joe. Do you have any? Sure. Just like um, to speak. I mean, my, I'm I'm I appreciate the issue of the town drainage and 19 spaces, but frankly, my my emphasis is more on the you know the traffic engineer going back and making sure that the traffic safety impact analysis is is adequate. Um, and, you know, the, the, the bottom line is once we, once we close a hearing, you know, we're, we're very limited in terms of what we can do. And, you know, if an issue were to come up on one of these points, how we, how we deal with it, that gets a little bit awkward. And I, and I guess all, all I'm, by the same token, I don't want to jeopardize your project, but, you know, we're, we're December 21st, where not much is happening in the world over the next week and our next meeting is on January 4th. So we're talking, you know, 12, 12 more days on a, on a large project, which, you know, from start to finish of the first time we hear it to the time we vote on it doesn't seem like a long time. So, you know, if you were to report back to your tenant that you're on a positive plane, but there's just some, some issues, some technical issues that are being cleaned up and, and addressed, but that you got, you know, positive uh, feedback, you know, could, couldn't that uh, work for you? Uh, I, I appreciate what you said, and I understand. Um, I'm not an emotional guy, but I, I honestly don't understand. I got the same comments, um, and I know I've been working on this for months, but to Mr. Woodward, and Ms. Kelly's uh, comments today. I literally got those th uh, read through the package that was provided this afternoon and was able to get out to the building and get pictures to show some perspective to the board. I've made every effort to try and simplify this for the board. I know that it's complexing, but the information is not a lot different from two years ago when we got approved for 610 spaces. Uh, you know, I brought the experts. It's after 10 o'clock, uh, I, I would be willing to, I've heard many people say that they're bullish and they're, uh, they like the project. I think a couple of conditions where maybe Mr. Vertucci redoes uh, his, his study a little bit to the town's uh, liking, uh, me providing some feedback uh, to the, uh, I can certainly go out and meet the neighbors before, uh, you know, quickly. I think an approval with some conditions, I don't think is out of, the, out of what I consider reasonable. Um, you know, I, I, and honest, I, you know, I've spent, and I don't want to harp on it, but I, this is a large project dollar wise and losing the next piece of that and the potential revenue that the town will generate, I think 
12 days is a long time. It's a lot of things can happen. Just to give you one quick, quick example, just the fact that the name Porter and Chester is out in the wind right now could lead their current landlord to offer them a, a deal that they can't refuse. That's better than my brand new building. And I could lose them tonight if I say, even if I say that they're bullish, it could happen just that their name is out in the wind, which is why I've been, you know, you know, biting my lip for the couple of months that I've tried to get this through the three commissions, that something like that doesn't happen. And if you don't think that happens, you don't know anything about commercial real estate, no offense. But it, it could very well happen that word gets out tonight that, you know, uh, it didn't get approved and the owner of the shopping center in Rocky Hill offers them something so great that they say, you know what, we're just not gonna do it, we, we're out. It's a condition of the lease that I get these approvals before the end of the year. So 12 days does make a difference. And all of the other commissions bent over backwards uh, at Denise's request to, to have meetings and, and get this through so that I could be here tonight, which is why I started my conversation with, I appreciate you taking the time three days before Christmas to hear me. And it, 12 days does make a big difference. It really does. Mr. Chairman, can Thanks. I make a motion? Yep. Uh, I make a motion to approve the application as presented by the applicant. Do we have to close first? Oh, yeah, sorry. we have to either table or close the hearing. Okay. I'll, I'll make a motion to close the meeting then. I'll, I'll second it. Close the hearing. All right. Motion by Peter, second by David to close the public hearing. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, hearing is closed. All right, Peter, did you wanna make a motion? I do. Uh, I would like to make a motion that we approve this application as presented with the uh, additional 19 parking spaces. Uh, that the applicant is requesting uh, with a couple of stipulations. Number one, that <clears throat> for safety reasons, that the applicant uh, meet with the town staff uh, and work out uh, the trip that occur over time and ensure that there's no safety uh, on exit and entrances on the Silestine or on Mill Street. And if it's determined by town staff that there is a safety issue that the applicant takes steps to remedy those safety issues. Mm -hmm. That's condition one. Mm -hmm. uh, condition two is that the applicant meet with um, uh, any neighbor that is willing to meet with him uh, and that the applicant uh, as reasonable as possible work out an arrangement with the neighbors uh, to, to put up some screening wherever appropriately located uh, on their property or, or elsewhere uh, to mitigate the impact of the neighbors uh, of viewing the ins and outs of the parking lot and the viewpoint to the highway. Second. All right, and you're for the for the neighbors right. you're specifically talking about Middletown Avenue, right? Yes, correct. Yes. Good good okay. uh, good point. Yes. All right. All right. George seconded the motion. Is there anybody have any comments, clarifications, other conditions? Could, could I just suggest that on the first condition that that language include that there'll be some re-examination and update by the applicant's traffic engineer on the uh, trip generation and, and impacts, but that it'll, it'll involve something from the traffic engineer as part of that process. Absolutely. I, I'm fine. fine on the yeah, front. that makes sense. How would we handle the, um, uh, how would we handle the neighbors um, in terms of how do they know that they can get in touch with him and this and that, like I, I'm sure we have the the contact list. Would we share that with uh, Mr. Panic and? Can you, I'm just yeah, he's got, the, he's got the memo that has all the all the addresses and names okay. and so forth in it. That was in the packet tonight. Okay, that's great. Would would it 
make sense um, for the applicant to at least let town staff know if he sets up a meeting to go out and, and look at the neighbor's property to at least give Denise or Derek the opportunity to attend if, uh, you know, if they're able to and feel that it would be helpful. Actually, that's that's a very good yeah. point. I think it would make sense. That, yes, I should. Yeah, that's a good idea. I would, I would Tom, also, you have. No, you might, can we can we put a time and also just a, a time a time on that or a goal to have that meeting take place by a certain time? I think would might help. I mean, so certainly not right during the holidays here, but just <laughs> just with a tie off on it. What What do you suggest? Um, end of January. Honestly, yeah. I was kind of I was I wasn't sure about a time frame only because anything that gets done is a bolt on to the project and it can be done next year. Like so I, I I'm I'm leery to to make that happen too soon, I guess. Yeah, right. I was thinking of well, was... meeting the meeting and 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 some some path forward coming from that meeting, some some documentation. Oh, you're that. you're saying the meeting with the town? Yeah, yeah uh, with the with the, the citizens on on um, Middletown Ave. Okay. Yeah, I, I think the idea was just to kind of make sure that the conversation happened sooner rather than later. Not that he's going to put trees in <laughs> in the middle of January or anything like that. No, just 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 the meeting and and the and, and getting some action going around it. Yeah. Dom I think that's important. I, I also think I'm sorry to interrupt. But I, I also think it's important too because it sets a good precedent for for future projects where you have Silas Dean Middletown Ave impact. Yeah, you're right. Dom, you have your hand up. Uh, yeah. If uh, I know you're in the middle of a a, a motion here, um, uh, uh, but if one thing I would ask you to do is from a staff standpoint is to have the professional engineer um, ad address and certify, you know, his, his opinion on the parking, including the 19 spaces. If you recall, he, 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 he stated that the uh, 215 were, you know, in his opinion um, and his professional opinion, that uh, were were appropriate, um, but he didn't. He he did not state about the nineteen. So, if he could just put that in writing, that'd be that'd be great for the file too. Thank you for letting me uh, speak at this stage. Dom, do, okay. do you want that as part of this motion, or is that what you said? Yeah. yeah why, why don't you do that? Why don't you do that? Make that your third stipulation. Yeah, let's let's add that as number three. That's fine. Thank you. So okay. Okay. That work for you, George. Yeah, fine. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And uh, right. we're going to modify number two with a time frame, right? Uh, Paul, the end of January. Yeah, I think that's I think that's long enough. You want to get past the holidays, but you don't want yeah. to get called out in committee. Yeah, I'd like to see you know something happen sooner than later, at least as a meeting of the minds and some ideas of what could be done that would be helpful yeah okay all right anything else that uh, anybody wants to on the table here let's vote mr chairman all right um any additional discussion if not all in favor of the motion please say aye Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Yeah. All right, motion carries. I appreciate all of the input and the town's input and you're hanging in there till a very late hour to hear. I really do appreciate it. And I just want to say that one last time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, and, and you know, although, you know, this is, and raking you over the coals. I mean, obviously, <laughs> we all appreciate your commitment to Weathersfield and economic development in town and, you know, what 
what you what you've done and what you're continuing to do. Um, you know, we're not trying to make things any more difficult than necessary. It's just you know, particularly with respect to the federal and state obligations under things like MS4. I mean, those these are the you know the boxes that we need to work hard on checking. So I understand. I Big shoulders, and yeah, I, I, mean, don't, I, I don't hold grudges. <laughs> okay. Good. Good All right. Point, Mr. Thank you. Uh, next item is 4.1 pre application review. John Carbone seeking his zone change at 82 Walkett Hill Road. Um, so I do see the applicant on. Um, before we start, I just wanted to make note that. This was an application that had come before the Zoning Board of Appeals um, and they did deny the application. So I've provided copies of the minutes from that ZBA meeting as well as a staff memo from the ZEO, Charles Morrison. Um, he had hoped to be able to be on the call this evening, um, but my suggestion would be to um, although this is not a formal application, I would have the applicant give a brief description of what they're looking to accomplish and then um, make sure that the next meeting uh, that the zoning enforcement officer can attend and um, answer any questions regarding the, the previous meeting. All right. Let John go then. Okay. <clears throat> so, so Denise, are, are, just to be clear, so you want me to just review what I'm trying to achieve here and then file the actual formal application to PNZ? And that's what I would, I would continue this discussion until maybe our next meeting when our zoning enforcement officer can participate in the conversation with the Planning and Zoning Commission. Okay. I'll give you a little background. Um, did you provide, Denise, did you provide the site plan? Yes, I did. A copy of the site plan. I don't know if everyone has it or has access to it. Um, but as Denise mentioned, I, I have a property on 82 Wolcott Hill Road. And in the, if you look at the site plan, you can see the highlighted portion of the plan. I don't know if you have it available. I don't have it on a PDF. But long and short, there's approximately 17,000 square feet of property that is somewhat landlocked that has an existing accessory building on it. And uh, essentially, it's a three, three bay garage that has been used for uh, one bay is used for storage, the other bays were used for maintenance and, you know, fit out material, things of that nature. And approximately, and that is a, um, a split use residential zone. And approximately eight years ago, we put up two additional structures because we can't park vehicles in those garages. They, they couldn't accommodate them. So essentially what we did about eight years ago and I was working with Fred Valenti, we put up two temporary structures. They were, um, it shows the little diagrams on the site plan, but uh, essentially there was two tent structures that were put up and we were parking vehicles underneath, a pickup truck and a uh, skid steer with a, a snow thrower for snow removal for maintenance on the property. And two years ago, a tree branch fell on one of them. It was uh, torn up pretty bad and we replaced it with a, uh, you know, a, it's like a temporary carport, standing seam carport. So we constructed that last October. We got notified by the compliance officer, of the town, that we needed a permit and a variance to erect that structure. So I went down, I met with Charles, we put it, we submitted an application and due to COVID, it was probably delayed about seven months before we actually got it, you know, uh, had a meeting, a Zoom meeting similar to this. And that was, I'm gonna say October-ish, we, we did have the meeting. And um, 
we went through the whole application, submitted it to, P, to ZBA, and ZBA denied the application, but two of the members on the ZBA recommended that we seek a zone change instead of trying to deal with this in the residential. They, they pretty much said, why don't you just seek a zone change, go to PNZ and try to get it commercially zoned like the rest of the property. And, um, you know, I said, I was just taking, you know, advice from the town and the compliance officer going, we never, we never sought to get the whole property zoned commercially. And that was the recommendation. I went down to see Denise, uh, you know, shortly after that meeting, I was on, I was scheduled at your last meeting in November. And I was on the call actually November 16th. <clears throat> and I had it on my cell phone. I didn't realize the meeting was going to be so long. So I'm doing other things. Yeah, we didn't you, Jim, Jim, you, what was that? Yeah, we didn't, we didn't expect it was going to be that long either. No, but I, I was, so I had, I had my phone, I had my earpiece and then I tried to get off mute and you said, I don't know, he was on earlier. You know, I logged in with my computer, then I called back with my phone and I couldn't get off mute for some reason. And you guys concluded the meeting. So I apologize for that. So, um, so I think that that's a little background on the property. Uh, you know, one of the things I share with Denise is the property borders two commercial properties. You know, if, if you're looking at the plan, you know, it, it borders the, the little convenience store there right on Walkett Hill Road. And then the back lot facing uh, east is, I think it's a residential zone, but they're doing some kind of, they're running trucks out of there. There's several box trucks, dumpsters, things like that. So I, it operates as a commercial property. I don't know what kind of permits they have or, or anything like that. But long and short, two sides in, you know, the third side abuts the Walkett Hill and which is commercial across the street as well. And then, you know, on the southerly side is all residential. So we are abutting residential. It's been a bone of contention. We have two, you know, there were two or three of the residents saying that, oh, we're running, we're doing construction and manufacturing, which is not the case. Everything in there is to accommodate the, the tenants and the building. And, you know, that was one of the bones of contention at the last meeting because a couple of them came out and spoke against it. And I think the board was inclined to, to kind of punt and said, hey, you know, we recommend you get the, the zone change. And that's why I'm here tonight. So I, I, zone change request, sir. Pardon me? Well, it's a, it's a pre it's, it's a pre-application okay. for, pre um, okay. you know, just for him to get guidance as to whether or not that's the correct process for him to go through at this point. Well, he either does that, right, Denise, or he can't continue this, right? Theoretically. Theoretically. Yeah. So, but it's a, just it's so a that problem. I'm clear. I'd say he yeah. needs to come with a formal application to us. That's what he wants to do. That's my thought. Yeah, I just want to be clear on what it was that you were trying to get approval for that the ZBA denied. Was it to turn these into yeah. actual buildings? Using the space. So, so, um, yeah, George says that we can't go back there. We can't park. We can't use the space. And that was, you know, so, going, go, be, go ahead, Denise. Because, because the structures were damaged, um, the zoning enforcement officer is considering it an expansion of a non-conforming use. Denise, were the original structures non-conforming? I'm really confused. I read through everything. It seemed to vacillate back and forth. Was it an original non-conforming condition or not? Um, I think the issue was, no. no. You know, um, the, the, the issue is that, you know, they were constructed for use as, you know, mate, for, for maintenance purposes and or for records retention for the property. and. The zoning enforcement officer over the course of you know the past few years has received neighbor complaints about the property being used commercially 
Yeah. So if I could just comment, I read through, we got this fairly late, but I read through most of it carefully. And one thing that's not clear to me, Trey, maybe you could, you could help clarify here uh, for when you come forward with this uh, officially. Uh, you do have the rights to do something in those buildings, right? Records retention was one. I, I think somewhere along the line, you went to ZEA or someone gave you approvals to, to do some limited amount of activity in those buildings, correct? Peter, when we when the building was constructed, this is going back to 2003, uh, we got approval to build the accessory buildings to service the commercial building, uh, understanding that it was in a residential zone. In addition to that, we also were allowed to park in that space. But what was going on was there was overflow parking and, and um, employees were parking in that space. And that's, that's the primary use. So we were using it for maintenance for the building, storage for the building and overflow parking. Like I said, about eight years ago, I was dealing with Fred Valenti and we, you know, we, we constructed the two uh, temporary tent structures because it was difficult to do all the snow removal and things like that, you know, when the elements were bad. So, you know, it, it wasn't any issue. We had those there for seven, eight years, and then one of them was damaged. And it's when we replaced the one that was damaged last September, October-ish, we constructed the standing seam uh, carport there and replaced it. And that's when uh, Charles you know, received the call that there was construction going on there. He notified us and said that we have to, you know, I had to come meet with him. So I met with him and he suggested I go to ZB, uh, ZBA and get a variance because it was non-conforming, like Denise said. Okay. So that's kind of what's going on. The, the, the other issue that comes across, and I don't know how accurately I read this, but it seems that at least some of the residents now believe that you've expanded your operation. It's no longer just records retention and what you originally had and parking of excess uh, cars that didn't fit in the original space. I mean, that's, that's a limited use. I think Correct. what I understood from the read was that uh, some of the residents are saying, you're, you, you got some sort of equipment there, you're loading and unloading, there's trailers, a lot of confusing back and forth in, in, in a lot of that. So, you know, what would be important to me is to understand, are you truly expanding your operation and, and are you asking to turn this into a commercial property that will give you expansion of operation above and beyond what you originally had. That's that's really the crux of what I'm trying to understand. Good, good question, Peter. So I, I, I think, you know, the expansion of the property was the uh, carport structure. We have a uh, pickup truck with a plow. We have a sander and then we have a skid steer that, that all are housed in that area. We haven't used it for overflow parking because there hasn't been a need since COVID and everything else going on. So we haven't been parking employees back there. Um, there is a trailer there that's that's used for servicing certain vehicle uh, equipment, you know, the snow equipment, the skid steer, and things like that. But other than that, and you know, it's for tenants. You know, we have tenants in the building that store things in there. When we just did a tenant fit out for a new tenant that came in last year, we you know, used one of the bays to do the fit out. So, uh, you know, that's, you know, it, it's not being used for anything more than that. There's no construction going on. There's no, you know, ma major, there are deliveries to the building. It's a, it's a commercial building. I mean, we have, you know, the office supply, the chiropractor has a lot of supplements being delivered. UPS comes regularly, but it's all business hours. There's no, you know, major deliveries going on there on a regular basis anyway. All right. So, okay. and, and you know, we, you know, my, my position is like, I tried to get Charles, come on out and look at what we're doing, what we have back there. You know, it's, it's clearly to accommodate the tenants in the building and to maintain the building. The difficulty is it abuts residential properties. So from I the outset, we, pro 
going back to, to when the building was constructed, we should have at that point, at that time, probably, you know, sought to have the zone change, but it wasn't, you know, we weren't guided in that regard. I'm afraid if you come in for a zone change, the neighbors on Livingston will come in force on you. Or have you gotten along with them over there? Well, it's it's interesting, George, because the one neighbor that's that's kind of yeah, the one neighbor that's really been like saying that we're you know creating a lot of noise or whatever it is back there is on Livingston Street, and I, I don't know if you have the little map, Denise. That oh yeah, there. I'm looking at it, and and you fact, see this I used to work with a guy that lived on Livingston Street, so I'm familiar vaguely from a long time ago but uh you know i just have a feeling those neighbors will not go 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 along with this but i may be wrong no you're That's gonna have a couple a point if you want to come in for a zone change and the town staff suggests maybe you want to try that or uh, you know and uh, rather than what you're doing right now fine you can try that and if you don't get it well you're you made an attempt, haven't you? To, 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 to resolve it to your satisfaction. Well, at this point, this is my only option, you know, to yeah, seek yeah, the, the yeah. change, you know? And, you know, they have problems with us having equipment back there. You know, there is a skid steer yeah. back there that, you know, you when it backs up, it beeps. Is it you? It's probably used, I'd say, two times a month and regularly when there's snow, you know, during the winter. So it's not something that's used every day or, you know, even weekly for that matter. So you know, I think you can come in for a zone change and there can be all sorts of conditions and, and fencing and things like that that could be, a, might accommodate the situation. You know, you don't know what could come of it. But yeah, I mean, the property, George, the property is like I said, it's it's 17,000 square feet in the back of the commercial property and, and there is a privacy yep. fence surrounding the whole property and it's a it's a six or seven foot privacy fence with a slope of about three or four. So it comes yeah, out. Uh, to and like I'm, I'm talking without going in and looking at it. So okay. um, I, I'd, I'd rather do that actually. Yeah. Okay. That would be the only. Opinion. I don't know how the other commissioners feel. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think, you know, it probably makes more sense than continuing to try to live by variance. My only question, and I didn't, I didn't look it up or read the regs or anything like that, is whether by actually changing the zone to the business zone, whether you would be triggering the requirement of additional bufferings or setbacks from the abutting residential properties above and beyond what, you know, there, there wouldn't be any requirement of buffering or setbacks, you know, substantially because it's residential. But I know that in some of the zones, you know, there, you know, there's either landscaping or distance buffers between things like parking in a commercial zone and a residential zone that, you know, that, that might kind of boomerang back and create a problem while you're trying to solve a different one. That's just something to, you know, look at and iron out before you, before you file the application, because, you know, you, you don't want to put yourself in a worse position by trying to improve it in one direction, like kind of regulatory whack-a-mole yeah no that's a good point D denise is that something i could look at with you with regards to like setbacks and things yeah i mean i think you know really as rich noted it's um specifically the landscape buffer requirement um from okay. business use to single family residential it's typically 15 feet landscape buffer but I can help you work through some of those details. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to put that out there. Dom, you have your 
your imaginary hand raised up there. <laughs> Yes, I, I do, uh, and it is imaginary. Uh, the uh, the only thing I want to remind the commission is, is that, um, you know, once you change the zone, um, all the uses, as well as buffers, like you say, Rich, um, all the uses um, then are appropriate, uh, you know, can go in that zone. So, I mean, you can't... I'd be very leery about changing of a zone and depending on one use, you can you cannot like change a zone with a condition that you know it stay this one use. So uh, you know that's just uh, a, a reminder to the commission. Thank you. So so Rich, yeah, I mean, you, it, Clea, can you clarify that? Like, it, could you do it? Like like I said, we're not looking to do any type of commercial activity. All we're trying to do is have a structure in an area back there that is going to service the uh, the existing building. So I don't know if you could condition that or something to that effect. Well, I mean, you can't really condition a zone change on anything. That's right. That, that's the, it's a legislative act. I mean, it's either, it's either residential or it's business, but um, you know, I think given the configuration of the property and what it is, um, right. you're not going to be building a brand new office mm. building in, in that little, you know, appendix of property out in the back. You just kind of want to be able to, you know, validate what's there now. Pretty much, pretty much. Okay. So this, this appears to be our only option to, to get through get over these hurdles, um, you know, like I said, because uh, ZBA, you know, the, not, the variance was too tricky, especially with people pu pushing back on it, you know, neighbors pushing back. So, Good. so I guess. Mm -hmm. so I guess the next steps are to, uh, Denise, you're thinking we do another pre with Charles or is that something we do Good. offline? Good. Good evening, if I may just come in here. Uh, I'm available to answer any questions. Oh, Charles is on the call now. Oh, okay. Yes, good evening, everyone. I'm here to answer any questions that the commission commissioners may have regarding this property. So, Charles, maybe you can give a... Um a brief summary of the process that they had through ZBA and the, the guidance that you've given, um, John. Yes, well, well like the um, applicant said, this, this property with these two structures and this, um, this three car garage, this, this residential um, part of the, the, the property, uh, the applicant wanted to have these two huge structures uh, to store um, commercial equipment, to store like a, a vehicle that would be used as a snowplow and to store a bobcat and other equi equipment related to, uh, to maintenance of the property. That, that's the understanding that um, he wanted to, uh, to, to use that that piece of property for. So hence he was seeking the variance. And if the variance was granted now, then he could, all he could do with that property was to store the vehicles there and nothing else. Well, I, I mean, I suppose if, if the zone was changed to commercial, then he could carry on commercial activities there. But um, the main, the complaints from the neighbors was that the activities were um, were not in keeping with the residential um, character of, of the adjoining property. Because first of all, there is concern about the fence. The fence was seemed to be hideous, a very high fence, and then there was constant noise, according to the um, to the neighbors, a constant noise coming from the property when they're doing whatever they're doing, moving around, uh, 
moving around with the equipment. And um, so since the, since the Board of Appeals rejected that variance application, the applicant was served with a cease and desist order. So according to the order, those, those structures should be down and they're not done. Um, he was since issued with a citation, which is accruing at $100 per day for the violation, which still exists. Mm. And um, in the meantime, I have been receiving complaints from the, uh, from the neighbors. Every now and then they call me and say, if you go there now, you can see they're working, they're doing activities. And on and, and a couple of occasions when I go there, what I see is the bobcat moving around and moving stuff from one place to the other, taking stuff out, going to the dumpster, to the property close to that, um, that uh, convenience store that was mentioned. There's a dumpster in the, by that side of the property. And uh, my observation was that the, the bobcat was constantly going backwards and forwards in and out. I saw a, a, a van that was um, that used to be that I saw in that residential property some time ago, and the van I don't recall the name now, but it's an electrical it's an electrical company, which uh, which according to the records, the address of that electrical company is 82 Walcott Hill Road, and that electrical company that van was seen. Uh, some time ago on the residential property, um, assembling light fixtures and other things. And um, it, it, it's suspect because whenever I approach it, then they would close the doors. Recently, like about a month ago, when I got the complaint and I went there and, and saw that Bobcat moving around, there were some gentlemen in that van and they came out and they proceeded to close the door, to close the gates rather. You know, because my, my recommendation to the Board of Appeals was that if the variant was granted, then they should attach a condition that have that gate remain open during the work day, which is like nine to five, and they could close it at, in the evenings for security reason. You see, so in that way, and I, I made that suggestion so that it could be monitored, that you could clearly see what is going on there because evidently someone is trying to conceal what's going on there and from my from my perspective when i go there that's what i gather some they're trying to conceal what's going on in that section of the property hey hey charles the um the van and there's uh two other vehicles that are tenants in the building they do not park their vehicles there they don't service their vehicles there, and they're very rarely there at all uh, in the back area. However, you know, we did do, I know they did leave removal because we have drains back there, sewage drains, and that was the skid steer. They were bringing all the leaves, dumping them in the dumpster in that back area. So I'm, I'm very familiar with that. But as far as any activity back there, you know, I have no problem leaving the gates open during business hours. And, you know, like I said, I, I sit here and I, you know, I tell you there's no work and I'm, you know, on a daily basis going on back there. And that's why the gates are closed because no one's going in and out of there throughout the day. Yeah, I think, I think this is sort of helpful in understanding why there's an <clears throat> issue, but I don't know that Relitigating the ZBA hearing in front of us during a pre application conference is accomplishing anything. Um, you know, I, I think if it's, if it's to the point that you want to keep these buildings and that the only path to accomplish that is to, you know, seek a zone change, then, um, you know, I would say file the application, but um, you know, just just take a look at whether there would be any kind of unanticipated consequences related to buffering requirements and those sorts of things that might, you know, kind of whipsaw you, um, you know, so that you, do, you don't put yourself in a worse position. Sure. 
um, trying to trying to resolve it in that manner. I mean, and and you know, frankly, if if you do file the application and we have a public hearing, then you know we'll be hearing all these conversations again and can figure out how, if at all, we we address it. But uh, you know, I think it is it is kind of fair to say that we can't really condition a zone change on changes or conditions on activities taking place, you know, within that property. I mean, that, that's just not how it works. So. so, so if there is a zone change, what, what could I, or can I do back there? Well, I think, you know, that, that was kind of the point that, that Dom was making, that if there is a zone change, you can do anything that would be permitted in that zone, you know, whether, um, you know, whether the, the structures that you want to install require a particular application or, you know, a change in use application, you know, it, it wouldn't be a, you know, it wouldn't be a variance and it wouldn't be non-conforming, but it would have to comply with whatever the requirements are to you know, to erect accessory structures related to a to a business in the business zone. So, okay, you know, it, it it's it's just basically a different, you know, regulatory paradigm than what you're operating under now, which is kind of either non-conforming use or variances. But, you know, it it would be as if the property had been zoned business. And what can you do on a property that's zoned business? You know, what are the setbacks? What are the buffers with respect to residential properties? Um, you know, what are the limitations on the size and the number of structures? You know, those kinds of things. And, and you know, if you want to put those buildings up, you know, would it trigger another application before us for, you know, either a site plan or a special permit that, you know, that just essentially leads to the same kind of conversations just in a in a different context where it's not a zba variance application okay i know you guys have had a long night so so just uh, if there's no other questions or comments so my understanding is that i should work with denise to put in a, a formal application and uh just address any potential buffer issues and you know setback issues and then uh you know also talk about those structures if it's going to be an issue or what we have to do if there's permitting or something to that effect yeah i mean just just kind of figure out what what the you know what the requirements would be you know to change the zone and to do what you want to do back there whether whether that's a more feasible path than you know than what you've pursued to date and if it's you know if it's essentially the only door that's open right now right. you know just kind of make sure that if you're going through it you do it with your eyes wide open as far as what the you know what the process would be going forward okay i don't know does anybody else have anything they want to say the only thing that I would add to what you said, uh, Mr. Chairman, is that you know, aside from the fact that there may be some limitations with setback and so forth, that there's also usage in the commercial area, uh, the operation that's going to go on in that commercial area. It opens up a, a whole new discussion on, on what's allowed and what's not allowed in a commercial area. Uh, so uh, you know, that, that would, Trey, that's something you really have to think about. Because now, now you've expanded the potential usage of, of that property considerably. And, and obviously the neighbors are not happy about that. So how, how you would condition or how you would approach uh, what you do there is, is also, I, in my mind, would be important to me to understand if you want to zone change there. I mean, if you sold this property, what's the next guy going to potentially be able to do with that? I, I need to understand that. Right, right. So could you condition the operation? Is that what you're saying, Peter? Well, yeah, we can condition the operation, hours of operation. Uh, no, yeah, I mean, as far as you're condition doing the that, operation, what we're doing there, I mean, that's all. We do that all the time in commercial property. Well, you know? Hours yeah. of operation, 
noise, music, whatever, you know, th th those are all things that we can, to some extent, control in a yep. commercial area. And, and, you know, I'd be more than open to that. Like I said, it's primarily to, you know, it's an accessory area for the building to service the building. So I'd be more than open to that. So I, you know what I'll do? I will. Um, I'm suggesting you, you, you describe that very clearly and forthright. So okay. There's no, there's no sense that you're trying to do something more than what you're doing now. And whatever conditions you're willing to accept, I think you should be clear about that. That's my opinion. Anyway, that's just an opinion. Yep. All right, thanks. All right, thank you very much, everyone. And Denise, I will circle back with you most likely after the holiday. Everyone have a Merry Christmas. You Take too. care, John. Thank you, you too. so thank much. You. Thanks so much. Um, next item, the minutes of October 19th and November 3rd. To be honest, I haven't had a chance to look at them, so I don't know if anybody else has. If you'd like, I can attach them to the agenda on the next, or to the to the end of the next agenda. Yeah, I would appreciate. Yeah, that. I mean, unless if, unless everybody else has had a chance to read them, I haven't. All right. Nah. Yeah, let's continue that then. Um, anything in the way of staff reports? Um, I, I don't really have anything else to report. Um, we did receive the application for 46 Arrow Road. That's the um, self-storage facility. So they're looking to modify their previous application. And um, the application for 222 Main Street, they're looking to be continued to the second meeting in January, lucky lose. Um, so that's that would be January 19th. That's a Wednesday. Both meetings in, in uh, January fall on Wednesday, uh, the 5th and the 19th. Um, I was, want, what do Lucky Lou want? Denise? He's looking to renew his, his permit renewal. for outdoor entertainment. A renewal to do entertainment. He what's had a, a, why is it he, different from what's going on now? He's, he's not looking to change any of the conditions, but one of the conditions of approval was that it expired in five years. So he was required to resubmit December 1st. That's all what he's doing, coming back yeah. in five. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't know at this point, um, we also are expecting an application for the, the previously approved child facility, child care facility in the Cardio Express 1199 Silestine. Uh, they're looking to the, the um, there was surplus tenant space and they're looking to do an indoor recreational facility, um, installing a pool and a few other amenities. Um, their intention is to have most of the clientele be the same user from the, the childcare facility. Um, but, but that probably will also be on our, our second agenda in January. So I don't know, I was gonna make this suggestion if you guys are comfortable with canceling the first meeting um, as it, it appears that you know the self storage is the only one ready to go forward at this point. Yeah, I mean, I'm I, I'm fine with that. I'm just also cognizant of having four hour long meetings every time, as, especially when we don't expect them. I thought this would be longer if Lucky Lose was on. <laughs> oh yeah, well, I mean, I, I thought we'd be done two hours ago. Mm. <coughs> Are the um, is the self storage modification a significant one or is it minor? Uh, the 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 parking layout has changed. They're reducing the amount of parking, um, and 
the um, floor plan has changed because the, it's a different end user, um, but it's not significant. Design review had um, just recently approved the modification. Okay. It's mostly architectural changes and the reduction in the, the parking. <coughs> Excuse me. But if you yeah, wanna, you know, if you wanna meet on on that the first Wednesday and try to get that out of the way, I mean that's that's up to you. Just that one. Yeah, I mean Frank. Yeah, I mean, frankly, I'd I'd rather try doing that because I know that we've in the past had a really hard time making sure that we have a quorum on Wednesdays because people don't plan for it. And I'd hate to have like everything at the second meeting and then have six people there. Okay. Or huh, or four like we did in July. Yeah. All right. Well, other than that, I really don't have anything to report. Okay. All right. Anybody else have anything they want to talk about? <laughs> other than wish you all a Merry Christmas uh, and a Happy New Year. No. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> have a great holiday. All right. Thanks. Everybody. Yeah, you too. Right. Thanks. Is Good night, you guys. Oh, we motion to adjourn. Oh, right. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> All okay. right. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Take care. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.